Well, hello everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 228. Thanks so much for joining me. Tim Siebels is here. We'll be with him in about five or ten minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle's a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been a continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this. We love poetry and know you do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notifications wherever you can do to help spread poetry around the internet, especially YouTube, which we love the most most, I think, uh, would be much appreciated. We are also streaming on Facebook and uh, X, of course. So if you uh, click on there, uh, feel free to share and uh, click the like button. It really helps. Now, we always start out with our Poets Respond poet. And uh, as somebody who flies a lot recently, this this article did catch my eye. My mom mentioned it to me because it happened at going to the airport I fly to very often. And that inspired a poem by Christine Potter, who's a veteran of um, Rattle and poets respond um and here she is hi christine how you doing good i'm good a little chilly but not terribly yeah well it definitely it's even i'm I'm in texas right now actually and it's cold here too it's like 26 degrees or something which for it's warmer here it's 27 wow that's impressive in new york yeah it's it's a it's it's one of those years i guess it's a polar vortex probably or something i haven't watched the news at all but i have uh, i did hear this news story this time and a few people wrote about it tell us uh, what inspired this poem and, and how it came to be Okay. Um, well, basically, I was as fascinated as the rest of the world with the plane, with the window that blew out. I am uh, a nightmare flyer. I hate flying. I am a caged animal. I cling to people. Uh, the only way I stay sane, actually, is I sit in the window seat and I look nervously out the window while trying to track the weather on my phone. I'm not making this up. Uh, so that completely freaked me out. I would have been out that window. (laughs) I was like, so I knew I was going to write about it somehow. And then um, I was taking my morning bath and looking at Facebook on my phone and I got the first line. And it kind of, it kind of came from there that this, the sort of um, being an orphan in some ways, Mm -hmm. um, I lost both my parents Uh, last decade or so but my parents lived a really long time they were both in their 90s i'm not used to not having parents so i write a whole lot about parents and children and i think that's where the beginning of that started and then the plane showed up again yeah that's that's interesting where do you think that i don't know where did that line come from the line we're talking about is it's a great first line i mean very quotable i might use it as the quote on social media we are all the children of what our former lives have been it's a fascinating thought in line where do you think that came from uh, the bathtub at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, um, I am I am um, honored and fortunate to be uh, a Facebook friend of Ted Coosier's. And so I often start my day with what he puts up. Mm-hmm. And I think I had been reading some of his stuff. But that that is not that is not, um, you know, I, I, I'm not pointing to a specific poem of his. Mm-hmm. But he often gets he often gets me going because he posts really early in the morning. So if I go online, it's often the first thing I see. Oh, that's interesting. Well, let's hear yeah. the poem and I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, okay. once we hear it. It's called What Next? What Next? We are all the children of what our former lives have been. Our parents were powerful, but they are gone somewhere we cannot know. Winter won't stay winter for long, enough to get a good night's sleep before it ends up there too. I don't mean spring. Maybe the hour after a storm, when the sky clears, when the temperature plummets, when even the jays at the feeder cry out, what next, what next? See their police blue tail feathers pointing back to where they've been. Life's not what we expected, certainly not fair. And much of it stops me as I strain to understand it. Pale, floodlit national monuments, God knows what echoing inside their stone columns and domes. Wind swirling something fierce outside planes aloft 
with emergency exits, blowing out for no reason except someone having forgotten it could really happen. The little patches of shelter below where we try to live. Yeah, that was Christine Potter with uh, What Next, What Next. A great first line and a great last line, which is a really great way to make a poem happen. Um, and it's also, if you look at the poem, um, I, I might have asked you this before, Christine, but I don't remember the answer, and I'm always fascinated by it. In your poems, you have, and I've read a lot of your poems over the years, um, you have the most consistent line lengths possible. It's almost like where some people, um, you know, go to the word and try to get the words to be all this. You get to go to the, like, the character um, so how do you go about doing that? Are you actually like counting characters as you write? Are you just eyeballing it? How does that go? Because if you look, um, I mean, go look at all of Christine's poems and they are within within like uh, little kernings of each other as far as the lengths of lines go. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the only thing I'm tidy about in my whole life. Look at my study. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, it just needs to look that way on the page. I mean, a poem has a rhythm when you read it out loud. I'm a free verser, obviously, although, you know, there's there's some music in there. I, I you know, little metrical bits and bobs and stuff like that, not consistently. But it, I, there's just sort of like my eye needs to make a rhythm when I'm reading it back. And mm -hmm. unless it's even like that, it doesn't make a, a nice rhythm for me. <laughs> well, that's just I so, that's it's what just, it is. yeah. Well, it's really interesting to me. And I think there's no other poet that I could, you know, tell it's a Christine Potter poem from across the room almost all the time because of that. <laughs> it's fascinating. Well, anyway, thanks so much for joining us again. I think this is the fourth time you've been in Poet Respond over the last 10 years. It's great to see you again, Christine. Yeah, it's good to, always yeah. good to see you. Yeah, and always. stay warm because it's definitely cold out there wherever anybody is. <laughs> yeah, take care. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. And once again, that was Christine Potter. Uh, that was Sunday's Poet uh, on Poet Respond. And uh, now we're going to take a quick break and go to our main guest, uh, Tim Siebel. So sit tight, and I will be right back with more poetry. And we're back. Like I said, tonight's guest is Tim Siebels. Uh, Tim's the author of seven collections of poetry, including Body Moves, Hurdy Gurdy, Hammerlock, Buffalo Head Solos, Fast Animal, which won the Theodore Rothke Memorial Poetry Prize um, and was nominated for the 2012 National Book Award and uh, One Turn Around the Sun. His newest book, uh, his newest full-length book, I should say, is Voodoo Libretto, which is right here. Uh, it was published by Entruscan Press. His poems have been published all over the place, all the best magazines, of course. He's a wonderful poet. Um, used to be the poet laureate of Virginia. He lives and teaches, at, or lived and, teach and taught at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, here he is, Tim Siebels. Hey, Tim, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Tim. 
It's always nice to have double Tims in, involved too. So it definitely is. It sure makes for confusing conversations and emails. <laughs> Tims don't come up that often in the poetry. I know, world. <laughs> I know. They're not that many. I remember there was for a while in, on my floor in my uh, in, at the university there were four of us, and we thought it was like a minor miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you call a flock of Tims? A, I don't <laughs> a collective know. noun. I, I, let me know when you. I don't know. Out. Well, we need one more, and we can have we can be a I don't know a contingency <laughs> of Tims, but. Um, <laughs> so anyway, do you want to start out with a poem? What do you want to read? Sure, first? sure. Yeah. I'll start out with a poem that's relatively new. Uh, it's it's not quite a year old. Um, it's called "Do They Own You," and uh, it has an epigraph. Uh, one of these days, I'm free this afternoon till four. I'm just about free. You free for the fourth? Did you buy one and get one free? I'm free on Friday. I think it's a free for all. I'll be free for a while, but not tomorrow. I'm free most weekdays this week. After that, I probably won't be free. You're gonna be free pretty soon. I got this one free. Did you get that one free? I'm pretty free, but not that free. Are y'all free or not? I'm freer than he is. Is this a free day? I'll be free after six. Did you get the free one or did you have to buy one? Can you get tomorrow free? I'm going to be free all day. Yeah, beautiful little poem. Uh, that was uh, Do They Own You uh, by Tim Siebels, of course. And a great poem to start out with, especially on Martin Luther King Day, as it yeah. is, Tim. Um, it, let's let's start talking about the beginning. You know, with uh, how much was Martin Luther King an inspiration for for becoming a poet? You know, the, well, the, the, from, yeah. I don't know the, whether uh, Dr. King was an inspiration for my interest in poetry. That would have come from people like uh, the Last Poets or Nikki Giovanni or Langston Hughes. You know, when I was a young guy. But uh, King was a huge figure in my life in terms of how I think about race and unity and the possibilities of human beings, you know, being compassionate and kind to each other. Uh, my father was in the March on Washington when I was a little boy. Um, so King was a huge figure in my life in terms, I, I have, a picture of him in my wallet that I've had since I was in college. It's the same picture. Um, he's just a huge figure in terms of how I like to try to think about what it means to be human in a, in a multicultural society. And, and of course, in a polycultural world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's King's inspiration to me is more about how I imagine uh, my full humanity more than he would be an inspiration for poetry. Yeah, but there there is such rhetorical beauty and so much poetry in those speeches. Um, oh God, I love yeah. them. Man. Yeah, I love I, so I'm interested in uh, the fact that you started out. You know, you were a football player um, early yeah. on, and, and found poetry sort of while you were also playing football, which is an unusual thing. Um, and nobody can say, by the way, the score of the Bills game right now because <laughs> I do not want to uh, find that out before I get to watch it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but um. Uh, but but tell us about that journey about um you know being you know such a serious coll collegiate athlete um and then uh and turning to poetry that way how did you come across poetry well to be honest my mother uh was an english teacher and from the time we were my brother and i were pretty little uh she would read to us stories poems fairy tales you know and um and so i was always attracted to literature. Now, if you had asked me at eight or nine, what did I want to do? I would have said I want to be a pro football player, but I liked stories and stuff. I did. I, I wrote stuff. I thought every eight year old wrote stories. I was writing stories, you know? I didn't write many poems. I messed around a little bit with some rhymes, but mostly I was writing these crazy science fiction stories. And that's really rooted in my mom's influence on me in terms of how she brought poems and stories to life. She had a really dramatic way of presenting stories and poems and, 
And uh, I, I think that for, for me, that made it irresistible. Um, I love football because, you know, as an American boy, you're, you know, heavily indoctrinated about um, sports, sp football in particular. And I, you know, I was lucky. I was pretty fast and I had pretty good hands. And I was a, I dreamed of being a great wide receiver, you know. Uh, but it didn't really work out. I only played a year in college, you know. I was only there for a year. Well, okay, part of the part of the second year. But um, I wasn't getting much time on the field, and it didn't appear that that was going to change because the coach that I had come to play for, for mysterious reasons, was fired, mm -hmm. and the coach that they hired ran a wishbone offense which you probably know is a running offense. And I was a wide receiver. It was, I was just kind of a blocker mm -hmm. after a while there. Um, so I was losing some interest in being on the field. And I think also my inner life was starting to develop, you know, sharply. I mean, I was suddenly becoming more of a thoughtful or reflective human being. Mm -hmm. And I had stumbled into a creative writing class. I didn't know what creative writing was, but I knew I liked to write. And someone said, Oh, Michael Ryan is going to teach creative writing. And I thought, I like to write. I, I guess creativity is part of it. But uh, and so but Ryan was a poet and uh, and he, you know, the, at the time, half the semester was poetry, half the semester was fiction. That was it. There was not a nonfiction feature or playwriting or anything like that or genre writing or anything like that. So he taught both parts of the, of the semester really well. But of course, he taught poetry with great fire in his heart, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was taken by that and also taken by all the things you could do with a poem. He read us all these poems. I had no idea, you know, poems could be really funny and serious or, 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 or entertain different kinds of feelings in the same poem. You know, I just, I don't know, I was fascinated by the possibility of being able to say certain things that I was not hearing in the general, you know, discourse out there. Um, and so that's really what got me. I, I discovered my love for poetry in, in a creative writing class. I was by, I was probably 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to hear. Uh, you know, similar to me, I played a little bit of baseball and realized uh -huh. I wasn't going <laughs> going anywhere with that. You know, riding uh -huh. the bench at a D3 <laughs> school yeah, wasn't well. the future. So uh, <laughs> so then you have to do something else, too, of course. And um, yeah. yeah, well, let's hear another poem. Um, what do you sure. want to read next? I'll, I'll, I'll read. Um, I'll read. Uh, I'll read Riddle. The poem Riddle. Um, I, do, I don't, do you have it? Yeah, I do. I have it here. Oh, OK, you have it. OK. Yeah, I, th I said I think I sent that one to you. Um, it's it's just called Riddle, and uh, it has an epigraph by W. S. Merwin, who was a huge influence on the way I think about music and poems, and uh, and also he, among others, but he was an important mystical influence on me too. I think Merwin, especially in the earlier work like The Lice and Carrier of Ladders and Moving Target, you know, he just had a, a kind of you know, cosmic kind of vision or something that I was very taken by. Anyway, this is Riddle. Um, the epigraph is by Merwin. He says, from what we cannot hold, the stars are made. When I saw the forest, it was late afternoon. The sky held the color of something almost forgotten. I pulled off the road, found a gravel path sloping toward the trees. It had to be the light that remembered my last Saturday at Y Camp, freshly husked corn roasting on the cob and all the nervous cicadas calming down for dark. Because I didn't know the handle could be hot, I burned myself pulling a skillet from the fire and was cursing quietly when a blonde boy I hadn't met 
told me to put my fingers in his milk. It's okay, he said, won't hurt as much. I was 12, stuck on the step between childhood and puberty, just starting to understand that I liked being alone and trying the riddle of how to be a person who might turn into an adult. At the time, I did not have these words, but on this drive, I'd been wondering about what I've become and how I live in this country. It all came back, the red and white carton with a bent straw in it, my fingers starting to blister, then the white kid's shy shrug of a smile. In the forest, it was already night. Yeah, it's a great example of um, the just the way your poems leap and move from, you know, seriousness to humor. Um, and that great last line, I love that, uh, that uh, in the forest, it was already night, which is such a, right. such a big leap transition. It's almost like the cut in a haiku. And that was Riddle oh. from Tim Siebel's. Uh, can you talk about your, your writing process a little bit, Tim? Like, what is it like for you sitting down and sort of confronting the blank page? And then how do you sculpt a poem from there? Well, um, I write often, um, probably five or six mornings of the week I'm trying to write. Um, even when I was teaching, since my classes were in the afternoon, I could get up, I'd get up early because I also had to grade and prepare for class, but I'd get up early and I'd probably spend a couple hours, maybe three if I was having an especially rich day, um, you know, working on poems, just trying things. But where they come from is hard to say. I mean, we all have an array of concerns that we live with. And so it's some days you wake up and you think, man, I don't have any idea what I'm going to write about. And some days you wake up and you think there's a dream in your head and you say there's some image or something that you really want to get down. That poem, for example, actually started as it is described. Uh, I was driving down the highway and I saw a forest, you know, as we often do when you're way driving way out in the country. And for reasons that are still not clear to me, I thought about that day at Y Camp. I hadn't thought about that in years and years and years. But it, it just, I was like, oh man. I remember walking into the woods of my camp and all this stuff just came back. And so when I have something like that, that's so clear, then the question is just a matter of, you know, how to get it down and really, you want the language to be evocative, but you also want it to be clear. You know, I want, I don't want people to hear any, if possible, I don't want people to hear my poems and say, what? or What's it about? You know, I want that to be, I want the subject matter to be relatively obvious. Now, the levels of feeling in the poem may be more complex, or the perspectives that come through may ask you to think a little bit more, you know, um, than something simple. But, uh, but I don't want there to be a, ever to be a question about what is at stake in the poem. So when I'm writing, you know, the first thing, of course, you know, you try to get what I call um, when I'm writing just a good take. Doesn't mean it's finished or anything by any means. It just means that it feels like there is a shape that is trying to be born. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of making the choices that allow the poem to, to live on its own terms. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. And so, yeah, many, many drafts. I'm not a, a lunatic draft person. I mean, probably many of my poems would be <clears throat> somewhere 14 to 25 drafts. Oh, wow. I, have, mm -hmm. I have written poems, of course, that are 40 to 60 drafts. If you really are, if you, if you really think there's something in there, and you think, I just have to get it right. You just keep 
writing and rewriting and rewriting or making your corrections and then rewriting and correct, you know. Um, but generally speaking, I'm reasonably patient with myself. So if I get a good idea or something that feels urgent, for lack of a better term, I, if I can get it down, if I can get what I think is a, a good take down, I might not come back to, I may come back to it the next day, but I won't just, you know, jump on it and just every day till I get it right. And I very rarely do that. I can write it for a while and mm -hmm. maybe leave it for a couple of days and come back and, you know, work, maybe I'll work on something else that I've already had drafted. And, uh, but so bit by bit, you know, the poem, at least it feels to me that the, that the, 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 the essence of the poem is revealed with patience. Mm -hmm. When I was much younger, I felt like I was more in a hurry. You know, I was writing four drafts, thinking that was a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but as I, as I got older and I certainly, you know, you read people and you love, you know, you know, you know, you read the poets that are amazing and you think, man, I want to, I want to write poems that have that kind of resonance. And you realize, I mean, one way or another that, that, that kind of work takes time. And so I, I've become more and more patient as I've gotten over. So the essence of my process is drafts, patience, thinking, draft, <laughs> you know, you just keep going until you feel that you've exhausted the possibilities of the poem. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a great explanation. I love that idea of the first or a uh, good take uh, as, instead of a, you know, if people say sloppy first draft or whatever, but having mm -hmm. a good take that you want to come back to seems like an important thing. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that, that that good take has most of the, the turns and leaps you'll make in the poem, or do you find yourself adding them later in the draft? Is, is a draft mm -hmm. sort of a refining and a polishing, or are you still generating new surprises? Often the, the revision process is the process during which a lot of the moves are discovered. Um, now, occasionally, and you know this, you'll have one of those days where a poem will almost come to you whole. I mean, sometimes you're, you're close and maybe you, five drafts or six drafts really is enough. But that's pretty rare. Most of the time I'll find something and think there's a feeling and there's something driving this thought. And so I try to, if I'm lucky, I get enough of the language down that when I come back to it, the feeling is is returned to me. And I think, okay. And that is the fuel that drives me further and further into the piece. But yeah, usually some of those turns and surprises, they come, you know, after draft, draft after draft after draft, you start to discover maybe the, the real, the, the true heart of the poem. And then um, certain things you can do that you think sharpen or sharpen the focus or you know, intensify um, the the circumstances of the piece so that, I mean, you hope what we what we all what, what I hope for anyway, is that someone reading the poem will have an experience of the poem that is at least something like the experience that I had that drove me to write the poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a really great way to put it. Uh, let, let's hear another poem. Um, sure. uh, what's next? Um. I'll do I'll do something formal. This is a uh, the Runaway Blues Villanelle. I, I I love the blues and I also love the Villanelle form, and they're both uh, rooted in the uh, work songs of poor people. Uh, the blues, of course, is, is rooted in field hollers of Black American slaves. Um, you know, repetitions to make the workday more more bearable. Um, the Villanelle is rooted, of course, in the in the similar circumstances of Italian peasants. Uh, they'd be working in the fields with very little, you know, money or, or or hope, and they would sing these repeating lines, you know. So I think the blues and the Villanelle are are, are like first cousins, and so this. So I wrote, I've written a series of blues Villanelles, probably forty or so. Who knows. This is called Runaway Blues Villanelle. I should say this. I make reference to Omar Sosa, who is a great jazz pianist from Cuba. Um, some of you may already know who Funkadelic, uh, the, the Funkadel Parliament Funkadelic, that's mm -hmm. George Clinton's band. Uh, if you don't, just look up Funkadelic. You'll hear what they sound like. Otherwise, I think most, most of this is pretty clear. 
Runaway Blues, Villanelle. Maybe we could all just fly away. Time will say nothing, but I told you so. Not sure what else time can really say. Not sure I want to write this anyway. Woke up feeling like, I just don't know. Maybe we could all just walk away. No, no use running hot and yelling all damn day. Mom told me no one monkey stops the show. Guess she didn't know what else to say. Maybe I should put my mind on layaway. Can't turn it off. Can't, tear, can't tell where it'll go. Think I might just turn away. Some of y'all go to church and pray. I look at the sky. I just don't know. Maybe we should all just run away. Gotta try something, come what may. When that goes wrong, they'll shrug, I told you so. Ain't that some worthless shit to say? People worry about who's straight, who's gay. The body's the arrow, the heart's the bow. Someday we'll all just fly away. When I go, just let Omar Sosa play. Then rock of my soul at a funkadelic show. You give me half a chance, I'd get away. When you think about it, same thing time would say. Yeah, and that was Runaway Blues Villanelle. And uh, you know, one of the many blues villanelles that Tim Siebel writes. And the, um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between poetry and, and, and the blues? I mean, there's a way, you know, if you, people who don't read much poetry come to it and they always complain outside of it that there's so much sort of darkness and sort of blues, really, in poetry. And there's a way that both of them, it seems to me, are releasing like um, energy or altering energy through using your body or something like that. There's something to it that has a lot in common, would you say? And, and that the subject matter and, and what we're doing so often with poetry. Do you, do you think that's the oh, case? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, lyrics and poems, I mean, song lyrics and poems are two branches of the same tree, you know, right? It's just that with song lyrics, melody, rhythm and, and rhythm and harmony are part of the meaning of the of the piece. Um, if you take a song away from its music, there are only a few that still work just as words. Whereas poems are in most cases have to be their own music. The words themselves have to be the music that and the rhythm and the harmony, if you will, uh, that 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 let the thing live in the air. Um, so to me, there's a definite relationship between poetry and song lyrics. Um, the difference being, of course, is that for me anyway, a poem allows you to get into, especially free verse, but all poems allow you to go places where the limitations of a song, you know, people have to be, well, often seem to have to be very simple in their lyrics. Now, this is not always true. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joni Mitchell, I would never say was a super simple lyricist. But many, many songs that are popular, if we listen to them out without their music, there is they're pretty thin things usually. Um, but if, in terms of the blues, yeah, well, of course, blues are rooted in sorrow, right? Blues are rooted rooted in bad times. But of course, the music, as you were saying, Tim, transforms that bad feeling into a good feeling. I mean, that's what makes it kind of blues kind of a sacred gesture, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think of poetry the same way that even the even the saddest poem, I mean, part of why we love poems, even the really sad poems, is that we're able to identify some of our own suffering and realize that it's shared, that other people have suffered similarly. That's what gives it its power. It's the same thing even with instrumental music. I mean, when I listen to it, like my favorite piece by Bach, is this is the stuff you the pieces that he wrote for solo violin there's uh, the partita number two in d minor the chaconne which is the last movement now i didn't know bach and bach didn't know me 
but I feel the absolute truth in that violin, you know? Um, particularly the version that Zeno Franciscati does. If you dig Bach out there, my friends, and you can find Zeno Franciscati's version of the Partita Number no. 2 in D minor, that violin is just, it's just too powerful. Sometimes, you know, I just, it's all I can do not to burst into flames when I listen to it. Um, and so I think there is that in poetry too. Uh, you know, take, you know, take, I mean, there's so many different kinds of poems one thinks about, but the sad poems, poems that deal with death or, or loss. I mean, I don't read those pieces to become more sad and, and uh, feel more vulnerable to the whims of the world. You, you read them because you want to understand that what you feel is, is not only yours and, and that someone can give a shape to your, your emotions that you maybe previously could not. You just were under the governance of some strange, sad anxiety. But then suddenly you read, you know, you hear a stanza or a particular line and you say, that's what I feel. That is the thing I would have said in exactly the same way that we listen to our favorite songs. You know, I listen to Sade Adu, for example. Um, uh, some of you probably know her Smooth Operator is a song that she may, might be most famous for, but she's sung so many beautiful things. And, uh, uh, and uh, I listen to that voice and I feel great angst and sorrow in it but there's such beauty in it that it still lifts you, it still lifts you. And that's what I hope for my own poems. And that's certainly what I've gotten from the poems that I love, you know, some kind of lift or, or an insight that allows me to, to feel more awake or more clear mm -hmm. on my own life. Yeah, yeah, I love that phrase you said, a, a spiritual gesture. You know, I always think of poems as prayers and people say that a lot, but that's sort of a loaded term. Um, but but yes. a spiritual gesture is a, is much less, um, you know, claiming its own significance at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, without claiming any kind of, you know, religious religiosity either. I, I right. like the way you put that because it really does feel it's some way that we connect with the deeper parts of self and parts of the collective consciousness or whatever it is in the universe that that, yes, that great yes. mystery yeah and it's a conduit to that that we're doing a sort yeah. of prayer to that but a spiritual gesture i love that yeah. um let's yeah. hear another poem all right I'll, I'll go into a whole different direction this is uh this is a persona poem in the voice of the roadrunner <laughs> <laughs> it's called commercial break roadrunner uneasy If I didn't know better, I'd say the sun never moved, ever. That somebody just pasted it there and said the hell, to hell with it. But that's impossible. After a while, you have to give up those conspiracy theories. I get the big picture. I mean, how big can the picture be? I actually think it's kind of funny that damn coyote always scheming, always licking his skinny chops. And me, pure speed, the object of all his hunger, the everything he needs. Talk about impossible. Talk about the grass is always greener. I am the other side of the fence. You've got to wonder at least a little if this could be a setup with all the running I do, the desert, the canyons, the hillsides, the desert, all this open road has got to lead somewhere else. I mean, that's what freedom's all about, right? Ending up where you want to be. I used to think it was funny. Road runner, the coyote's after you. Roadrunner. Now, I'm mainly tired. Not that you'd ever know. I mean, I can still make the horizon in two shakes of a snake's tongue. But it never gets easier out here alone with Mr. Big Teeth 
and its acme supplies, leg muscle vitamins, tiger traps, instant tornado seeds. Come on, I'm no tiger. And who's making all this stuff? I can't help being a little uneasy. I do one of my tricks, a rock scorching razor turn at 600 miles an hour. And he falls off the cliff, the coyote. He really falls. I see the small explosion, his body slamming into dry dirt. So far down in the canyon, the river looks like a crayon doodle. That has to hurt, right? Five seconds later, he's just up the highway, hoisting a huge anvil above a little yellow dish of bird feed. Like I don't see what's going on. You know how sometimes, even though you're very serious about the things you do, it seems like secretly there's a big joke being played and you're a part of what someone else is laughing at, only you can't prove it. So you keep sweating and believing in your career as if that makes the difference, as if playing along isn't really playing along as long as you're not sure what sort of fool you're being turned into, especially if you're giving it 100%. So when I see dynamite tucked under the Acme Roadrunner cupcakes, as long as I don't wonder why my safety isn't coming first in this situation, as long as I don't think me and the coyote are actually working for the same people, as long as I eat and get away, I'm not really stupid, right? I'm just fast. Yeah, I love that ending too. Great poem again by Tim Siebels. That was a commercial break, roadrunner, uneasy. Uh, what about a, a lot of persona poems that you do too, Tim. And, and that's one of the things I just always love about your work. I was excited to have you on because you have so much variety in what you do. And the persona poems are one of those things that, that the variety comes through with. Um, you know, the, the poems on Blade, the comic book hero and things like that. Um, what is it that draws you to that persona poem? Um, you know, is it, it seems interesting to me because it could be a way to connect. We're always trying to find wider on audiences for poetry. And it, is it that part of it to connect with people who might not read poetry, but, but read, you know, other things, or is it more personal? Do you think? Well, you know, it's, I mean, I always want people to love poetry. I mean, I'm a poet, of course, but I'm just saying poetry has been really helpful to me. I mean, sitting with poems, thinking through poems, feeling a way into poems has helped me be a more complete human being. So I believe in poetry as a as a way as a way into the world, you know. Um, so when I'm writing, I'm mostly writing because I've I've been moved by something like I grew up watching cartoons religiously, especially the Roadrunner and the Coyote. I watch every Saturday morning, the Roadrunner, no, the, the, the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner hour. It was on for an hour. They had Bugs Bunny cartoons and Roadrunner cartoons. <laughs> I, I don't know if I missed one of those Saturdays in five years. I don't know. I saw that stuff. I was in there. And so I was unaware of the possible allegorical implications of the Roadrunner and the Coyote when I was a little kid. I just was mesmerized by those stories. It was funny. There was that slapstick craziness that always went on. Uh, but as I got older, just on, the, on a lark, I watched a series of Roadrunner Coyote cartoons, just, I think there was a video or something in a video store. And I said, oh, I used to love this. And I didn't have anything to do. And I said, I'll just watch a series of them. And I thought, oh man, they're talking about lots of things in this, with this cartoon. This is not to say you can't just enjoy it as a cartoon, but man, the allegorical implications. I mean, as an adult, when I was watching it, they screamed at me, you know? 
And so I was moved to write because of that. Um, I I don't think I've ever written a poem because I thought more people would like the poems. In my mind, I mean, and I may be deluded, of course, if you write a good poem, people are going to like it. <laughs> you know what I mean, <laughs> so you don't have to really look for ways to make people like poetry. Just write a good poem. And if you're if your feet are on the ground and you're speaking the language that is shared by your fellow citizens, I mean, for the most part, we of course, there are people I will never reach, of course. Hmm. But if you're speaking a language that is accessible, I think, man, you can write about almost anything. And people will be drawn to it because I think there's there's something really compelling about clarity mm -hmm. because so much of our daily lives are just a muddle of getting through one thing, going to another, very little time to reflect mm -hmm. on what it is to be your own self, you know? So so I just I just like to write. And in terms of variety, I just like all kinds of things, you know? It's like I've never felt like I had to write in one mood or about one particular subject. And I mean, I, part of the what drew me to, to, to the art of writing was the freedom in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, why should I not write everything? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I love that too. The, the clarity, of course, is one of the central things we care about at Rattle too. And, and one of the things uh, I think is, is sort of right up there with it is truth. It's sort of an honesty that we're looking for in this world of bullshit. You know, that's why I think poetry is never going to die Absolutely. because um, there's so much just nonsense and, and lies everywhere. And, and poetry are you. these moments of sort of articulated truth. Absolutely. Uh, is that something that you sort of are actively seeking as you're writing? Is it truthfulness? Is that what a voice means, would you say, when you're well, finding that? It's interesting that you ask. I'm not sure. I mean, certainly it's not a conscious thing. Like, I would not, for example, say to you, I was writing this morning seeking the truth of, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> say that. But I think um, a search for the truth undergirds all serious writing. We all want to know what we really think. We all, we all want to say what we really mean, not partly mean, but what we really mean. Um, we all want to, to, to explore our minds uh, in a way that re reflects, I think, the broadest sense of our own consciousness, you mm -hmm. know? So I think, I think truth is necessarily a part of that. You know what I mean? I think when I'm writing, even when I'm writing something wild, like a persona poem in the voice of the Roadrunner, I'm still trying to get at something that is true. It can be an emotional truth, it can be a, a social political truth, um, or it can just it can be a personal truth, a sense of one's own uh, anxiety about being made a fool of by societal imperatives. Mm -hmm. I mean, there can be that, right? But you'd like to think that maybe the truths in po the, the truths in poetry operate on many levels, you know? So some of what I, I mean, I write because I love to write, but of course I also love the idea that poems can be part of a larger discourse between myself and the people with whom I share the, the present time. I mean, in a hundred years, none of us are gonna be here. We, were, we would have, this. these are some things that were buzzing in my head during the 20th and 21st century. Mm -hmm. In a hundred years, if someone's reading any of my poems, great, but there's, it's wildly unlikely. <laughs> but you hope that, that by then that maybe other people will, you know, they'll be building, even unknowingly building on what the things we tried to do in 2024. Mm -hmm. They like, you know, they're, they're, there'll be something about what we tried to do that they try, they're also trying to do because we're people. Everyone's a, people are trying to say the thing that's essential. That will always be the case of poetry, like you were saying. <laughs> Well, we're uh, a good way through the show. We haven't really talked about Voodoo Libretto, which is your yeah. newest, you know, full-length book. We have a really amazing chapbook we'll talk about in a minute too. But I love um, the title is one of the greatest titles um, that uh, I've come across. Voodoo Libretto. Um, there's just something so. I mean, you know, the the, the clash of different styles and different f feelings and moods is like so present in that title, which makes you think of both, you know, Hendrix and the opera which is a kind of good mashup for, for what your poems do. Um, yeah. How did you come up with that title? And what was it like putting together the new and selected book? Oh, man. Well, I'll try, I'll try, not, I'll try not to talk really long time. 
<laughs> um, Hendrix, um, the other picture that I have in my wallet since high school is the picture of Jimi Hendrix. He was a huge figure and remains a huge figure in the way I think about the usefulness and, and the real meaning of what artists are trying to do. Um, and so he's, I have thought about Hendrix probably every day since I was 12. <laughs> you know, my brother turned, played a, a, a Electric Ladyland uh, for me when I was 12. He was 17 years older. And even as a little kid, when I heard Voodoo Child, I thought, there's something about that. And and I, I was kind of scared by it, <laughs> which I think about now and I kind of laugh. But when my brother wasn't home, I would sneak back down this, into the basement where the record player was, and I'd play Voodoo Child and just listen to it. And before I knew it, I was a full-blown Hendrix freak, you know? Um, uh, and so... I love the idea of having him. You, you I, I mean, I know you couldn't have read that whole that whole thing, but uh, there are several references to Hendrix um, uh, throughout that uh, the new and selected, and a libretto is like a long um, a long written song, right? Opera, right? And so I thought, well, voodoo because voodoo is also kind of a mystical African spirituality involves you know that. And libretto, because that book is a long song. So that's how it came together for me. And I, I, but as much as the meaning, the sound drew me to it too. I just love the sound of voodoo libretto. I just <laughs> love that sound, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, what, that's where uh, the title comes from. I wanted to make a, a very straightforward gesture regarding my love and admiration um, for, for Jimi Hendrix. Uh, and also, you know, there's so many other things, of course, that I love and, and that are in that book, but I wanted that in there. And the, the idea of, of a libretto being a long, you know, vocal piece, I just thought it was kind of they, like those words were made to be together, you know. Mm -hmm. And what um, was it like, like putting together, like going through your old books? Uh, did you find, yeah. you know, I think, I mean, I can't imagine it because I don't have you know, that many books. <laughs> but uh, but going back, I imagine like there's some things you forgot that you wrote, even looking back at like the earlier books. It was that the case. And did you find well, things that you that surprised you looking back that you didn't think you liked as much as you realize you do now later or, or vice versa? Was it was it interesting in that way? Well, I didn't, well, I never came across a poem that I didn't remember writing. Now that I did not, I did not have that experience. But of course there are poems in the early books that I haven't read aloud or looked at, you know, in years and years and years. And so there was a kind of, for minutes anyway, there were a kind of sense of, of, of encountering a younger version of yourself in verse. And I really, I really loved that actually. Um, the hardest thing about putting such a book together is what to leave out. Hmm. Because, of course, I, you know, I love my poems, you know what I mean? You know, I, for better and for worse, you know, <laughs> just you write and you think, I love this thing. I think it's got something in it, you know. But, you know, of course, I'm aware that there are more, some poems that have more resonance or, or, or perhaps more worthy of an audience than others, I suppose. So, but it was tough to leave things out. And, and of course, over the last couple of years since uh, Voodoo Libretto has been out, I've had people say to me, oh man, I, I was thinking such and such was gonna be in here. You know, and I'm like, oh man, you know, maybe it should have been in there. <laughs> you know, I didn't know, you know, so that was the hard thing. So I put about 15 poems from each book, 14 to 16 poems from each book um, in there, and then, um, then of course, the new and selected section, um, the new section rather. And um, man, you know, there's a lot of pieces that are just they're not in there. And of course, I look at the book still, and I think, oh, maybe I should have put that rather than that. You know, <laughs> so I don't know, man. It was exciting to put it together to get a sense of how how many years I've been writing and. And to get a sense of how I've, I've been traveling in poetry, how I've been traveling in my mind, and how, of course, the the, the poems get complex differently as I as I gotten older. Um, I still love some of the poems in the first. I mean, I love all the poems, but um, for different reasons. But uh, but in the first book, you know, I I couldn't write poems like that. I don't think exactly anymore. I'm not sure I'm that kind of writer anymore. 
there are things about them I love, but I think my mind just works differently in terms of composition, the way I imagine composition. But uh, but yeah, it was a, it was exciting to see to get a sense of how you've grown, or or, or how the gears have shifted in your mind, mm-hmm. um, how how the world weighs more and more heavily on us as we get older for yeah. for a number of reasons. You know, do you, do so, you feel like the same person? Like you know, I mean, there's that whole thing about how our cells change every you know seven years. We're totally regenerated, kind of reincarnated yeah. throughout life. You know, did you feel like you were reading somebody's poems? Uh, you know, that, that wasn't quite you. There was a, a different sort of version of you. Maybe did you feel still connected to that poet from? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because I could see the links even to the in the first book. I can see the links to that to what I'm doing now. I could see that. Um, as I said, I, I don't think I could write those poems now, but I see the links. I see the roots of a lot of what I do now in those poems. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I feel like the same person. I'm just an older version of that <laughs> person. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I should say now, if anybody has any questions for Tim, of course, leave them in the chat windows. Um, we've got a couple already on YouTube or Facebook, and I can pass them along. And do click the like button if you haven't yet. We've got about twice as many listeners as likes, so uh, that always helps the poetry randomly pop up on the sidebar. So click the like button if you haven't yet. Uh, let's see another poem, Tim. Uh, what's next? All right. Let me, read, um, let me read Naive. Why not? Read Naive. Um, this has also has an epigraph. Um, uh, a friend of mine uh, is a photographer, well, actually, my, my great beloved <laughs> uh, uh, is a photographer, and she was traveling in Amish country, which also there are Mennonites there and other people. And this, and she somehow met this woman who was a Mennonite, and the woman said something that you would never hear from those of us who grew up in the cities. Um, The lady said, and this is the epigraph, I love you, but I don't know you. I just, I just thought that just, that just floored me when she told me about that. So this poem is called Naive. When I was seven, I walked home with Derek DeLarge, my arm slung over his skinny shoulders, after school sun buffing our lunch boxes. So easy, that gesture, so light, the kind of love that lands like a leaf. It was 1963. We were two black boys whose snaggle-toothed grins held a thousand giggles. Remember, Remember wanting to play all the time as if that was why we were born. Those hands that bring us shouting into this life must open like a fanfare of big band horns. Though this world is nothing like where we'd been, we come anyway astonished, as if to Mardi Gras in full swing. There must be a time when a child's heart builds a chocolate sunflower, while katydids burnish the day with their busy busy wings. This itching fury that holds me now, this knowing the early welcome that once lived inside me, was somehow sent away. How I talk myself back into all the regular disguises, but still walk these streets, believing in the weather of the unruined heart. My friends, with crow's feet edging their eyes, keep looking for a kinder city, though they don't want to seem naive. When was the last time you wrapped your arm around someone's shoulder and walked him home? Yeah, another beautiful poem that was Naive by Tim Siebels. Um, 
Yeah, another great poem. Um, I think that one too is from v- uh, Voodoo Libretto, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I and know. also, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm not sure either. I was <laughs> I was trying to keep track and I lost track. So <laughs> I'm but, losing track too. <laughs> yeah, but I love the poems you sent. You, you know, I should mention I should have mentioned already that you're a Rattle Poetry Prize finalist uh, in the current issue of Rattle. And that poem, Ants, and then there was another poem in there too. Um, I just loved, and then it was one of those really fun unve- unraveling, kind of un- unveiling, <laughs> revealing things where you open up the name and you're like, oh, that's Tim Siebel's. That's so cool. <laughs> so I'm glad to finally publish it, Tim. Um, and the other thing you sent that was so cool is this Something Like We Do, which is a limited edition chapbook uh, from Catapult Press. Um, very interesting concept to this little book. <laughs> and I was very surprised by it. Um, <laughs> I wasn't sure what to quite make of it reading through. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, about something like we did? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I have I have always, you know, enjoyed science fiction, of course, you know, from the time I was very young. And I'm very interested in who else might be in the universe with us. Um, I've done a lot of reading, and I think one of the things that people pretty quickly forget is that our solar system is a tiny little part of our galaxy. And the galaxy (laughs) is gigantic and is a tiny little part of the universe. And I think the idea that there's nobody else in the whole universe just strikes me as insane. You know, it's, it's so vast, you know. Um, and, uh, and so I'm sitting by uh, in this courtyard. I often write outdoors when the weather's nice. There's a courtyard by the museum. Uh, here, the Chrysler Museum, a lovely museum, very nice courtyard, very quiet, beautiful big tree under which I sit, right? Uh, and uh, I heard this line. They were amazed that we still tried to build cities, that we, the way we might be surprised that birds can build nests without hand. That that entire phrase came, mm-hmm. I mean, oh, sentence wow. came to me. And I thought, who, who's, who's amazed? <laughs> who is, who's amazed that we try to build cities? And then suddenly I thought, it's the, it's the visitors. They're, they're coming and looking at how we are trying to live. And they just think, wow, <laughs> these guys, <laughs> they don't know what they're doing, you know? And so I started writing the first poem, something like we did. And I I guess I could read it if you want. Um, I thought that was the whole thing. I thought, that's it, right? And then I said, they might have other things that they would like us to know. (laughs) And pretty soon, (laughs) there was a whole series of poems in which the speaker of the uh, of the of the the poems were in, in various ways interacting with these aliens, um, and we find out in the poem that they they were the people who started life on this planet. They started life, and now they've returned to see how things have gone. You know, and uh, I, I mean, I, there's much more going on than that, but I can't just tell everyone everything. Uh, but I just, I don't know, I just got wrapped up in this idea that these beings would come, would be here and they would, you know, walk around and be interacting with us in ways that, you know, would show us in some ways perhaps just how ridiculous we are, you know, killing each other and, you know, allowing such suffering to be in the world and cultivating any number of prejudices. Mm-hmm. against people of different faiths, different skin colors, because their sexuality is different. And they would be saddened deeply <laughs> that this is what we had come to. And so I was I was really just let myself be swept up in the idea of what would it be like to have interacted with such beings? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's what the book, that the book is really me just, you know, working out some of these ideas that how would we appear 
to an intelligence that was far older, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think about this sometimes, and I, I, I can ramble like a madman, as you've already probably realized. Um, but people often forget also that the insects that are on Earth are far older than we are in terms of their presence. And so it always tickles me when people, you know, consider insects pests. Like, if we really think about it, we're the pests. <laughs> we're the ones who came in and started messing up everything and putting them in this place and spraying them with raid and all this stuff, you know. They were here probably a couple of a well, hundred million years before we showed up. And so, but they're the pest, you know what I mean? And so, and I think about that, like the intelligence that allowed these these insects to survive for hundreds of millions of years. And we don't, we don't think about that. We don't think about what is that intelligence that they have? I mean, ants, uh, you probably know this too, ants outnumber human beings probably 10,000 to one on earth. Mm-hmm. We never think about that. They're here. <laughs> They're all around us all the time. But we just regard them, oh, don't let them in the kitchen. I don't like ants on the counter. It's like, they're they're all over the place, you know? And, uh, and that goes for, of course, many other kinds of insects. But well, I was fascinated by the idea that there are all gradations of intelligence. And we are, I think, a pretty amazing species, human beings. But there are probably much older beings that are on our continuum who would see and understand things that we aren't even beginning to, to grasp. I was thinking about this, and I'm, I'm going to stop after this, Tim, because I know you're, you're going to just cut my mic off. <laughs> but we've had electricity for about, what, 120 years, 140 years? Mm-hmm. And look what we've done in 140 years. I am now speaking to you through a computer. This is insane. In my lifetime, this would have been sci-fi. When I was 15, this would have seemed like science fiction, like fantasy, right? Imagine, if you will, a species that has had electricity for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. What What would they be doing with that? How far could they have extended their sensibility? Anyway, that's it. I'm not saying another word. But that, but that was the the energy that was driving this whole, this whole, this crazy book about uh, about uh, the possibility of another intelligence visiting us. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hear this poem. Let, let's do uh, something like we did. All uh, right. The the title poem. I mean, there's there's five uh, five versions of it. Or five it throughout the yeah. book. Let's yeah. do the first one now. Maybe we'll do another one too before we go. Sure, but the first one, first one will give people a sense of what you know what I've been trying to do with this book, um, with this uh, this series. Um, each of the poems, I should say, uh, has an has an epigraph by a different black composer, many of whom talked about space, and I thought that's interesting too. And uh, so this is uh, this one. This is the first something like we did, and the, it has an epigraph from Sun Ra, the great kind of completely revolutionary jazz artist, um, the late Sun Ra. He is gone now, and he had this song. Uh, this song called "Space Is the Place," and if you you can look it up too on YouTube, put in Sun Ra, "Space Is the Place," and you'll hear hear what he's doing. Really out there. Something like we did. You could tell they were surprised that we still tried to build cities. The way you and I might be amazed that birds can build nests without hands. They saw how we lived and made a sound like rain sifting a river. For a lot of us, knowing we were not alone brought relief from the headache that had lasted all our lives. Of course, some people were scared. The religious held on to their books, claiming this was all make-believe, even when it was undeniable. The 61 ships stacking light in the clouds emerald green at dawn, lavender in late afternoon, 
the engines nearly quiet as if the sky were breathing. They walked something like we did, but the right foot stepped twice for each step of the left. So it appeared they were either testing the ground or considering a dance. Their skin was dark, but transparent. Their hearts like ours, but visible. And when the military began to mobilize, all the big weapons turned into barrels of wine. And whatever we tried with knives or guns, we somehow ended up doing to ourselves until it seemed insane, even to us. Each time one of them spoke, it was like a piano if Cecil Taylor were playing. Voices bending the air the way chimney swifts swoop, half turn, sling back. But after a while, when they watched us, their lips shimmered and something long ago closed their eyes as if we were a memory of who they once had been. And they'd come to Earth to prove their existence and mark the promise of another world, someplace we might actually go if we could see inside ourselves and trace what was there. Yeah. And that's a beautiful poem, something like we did. Um, it's beautiful taking a topic like that and turning it into such great poetry. Um, <clears throat> and I, I just I just love it, too. I've always been a fan of, of science fiction and the paranormal, too. Have you ever seen a, a UFO or anything you couldn't explain? The, uh, well, I have, in fact, but n- n- I've never seen any beings <laughs> from, from them. But, yeah, once uh, months long ago, I was, I, was out, I was out very late at night. I was in Texas, uh, in one of the suburbs of Texas, uh, of Dallas, rather. And uh, I, was, I parked my car, and I was walking up the, up the sidewalk. I was getting ready to walk up the sidewalk to the house where I was staying. And I saw a small object, probably the size of a softball, sitting in the grass, spinning hmm. and glowing. Wow. And, and, I, and, I, and I stared at it for a while, and I, but I got a little nervous. I wasn't sure what I was looking at. And so I watched it, and it went dark. <laughs> and then, and then I, I went over to where I, I thought I saw it, and there was nothing there. <laughs> and I was stone cold sober. <laughs> you know, I wasn't like I was hallucinating. I was half out of my mind with whiskey. You know, wasn't anything. Like that. I was stone cold sober, and I thought. Hmm. And the next morning, you know, I went. I went back. You know, I woke up and walked over and looked mm-hmm. at that yard where it was, and I didn't see any sign of anything. And I thought. Hmm. And I just kind of shrugged and thought, well, maybe it was a trick of the light or yeah. something. But it was a but. To my recollection, it was a small globe, and it was spinning hmm. in the grass, just spinning. And it was this light that was flickering, spinning. And, you know, I was hoping I'd go back the next day, and it would be like a water sprinkler. And I'd say, oh, it was a sprinkler. It was just off or something, you know, something, mm-hmm. you know. But it didn't look like a sprinkler, if I'm honest. It looked like a small globe. <laughs> and so that's as close as I've come to saying, was that something from somewhere else? You know, but I don't know. I yeah, yeah. There's a magic when those kind of experiences show up. I had I had one of them myself where I was watching a movie and looked oh, out yeah. the window and there was a light hovering through the trees. Wow! And I was like, "What is that?" And, I, and we live in a, a you know mountainous wildfire kind of area, so I was like, "Oh, I hope that's not a helicopter like looking for a fire," which happens a lot. And it was like yeah. late September in California, and uh, I went outside in the deck to look at it, and it was just completely silent, and then shot straight up in the air. So it like shrunk and shrunk till I couldn't see it. Amazing. And, uh, and then Amazing. there's all these, uh, there's a whole record of it on our town message board. So you go back to that date and everybody, there's like a dozen people saw it, had no idea what it was. Amazing, man. Probably well, some kind of, you know, military thing, but who the heck knows? Yeah. And I just possible. love that there's mystery in the world, you know, there's oh, so much yeah. room for yeah. it. And we kind yeah, of go too. through our lives 
Me you know, too. and there's Me so too. much mundane in our lives. You know, there's so much like, what am I going to have for dinner? Am I going right. to, you know, avoid the Bills game score right. for as long right. as I can so I can enjoy it later? <laughs> right. Like all right. those kind of things. Meanwhile, we're this tiny little speck on this tiny little rock in this tiny little solar system with right. so much more possibility going on. Even things we can't oh, see. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I love this book. It was so fun to read. To, and to the way you set it up, because um, you know, I think you've kind of revealed that it's uh, – that it's sort of another persona poem, but for mm-hmm. reading it, you don't really know that at first. Cause right, right. You well, get into it with that idea. preface. Yeah, that's It's fun. supposed to feel like a journal. And, but, you know, of course, you know, I mean, eventually people will, will probably think this is an invention, right? This is not nonfiction, you know? So, but it was funny. I, a friend of mine, uh, a guy read it and said, cause I had placed it, you were, as you recall in the introduction in Southeast Virginia, and he said, I was reading about a particular phenomenon that happened in in this area some years ago. Is that what you're referring to? Hmm. And I I had never heard of it in my life. You know, I was just inventing this place, you know. And so I I hope it, it feels like a possible, like it could be a germ. It hmm. could be. Um, a series of actual recollections of an experience. But I think with, with I mean, if someone reads it and rereads it, they probably would get a sense that I'm, you know, composing a, a world, a, a possible world moment. Um, but that's not, you know, I, I, I would hesitate to say, no, it literally is true. That would, that would be, I'd be quite the leap. <laughs> Well, maybe you get it for marketing, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So uh, I want to ask too. You know, this is tonight is happens to be the Rattle Chapbook Prize deadline, and the fact that this is a chapbook is interesting too. It's a beautifully done chapbook, I should say, by uh, Catapult Press again, and just yeah. great. Uh, it's a limited edition chapbook, so it's really great care was put in. It looks like hand stitched binding. Yes. And, yeah. It's uh, a tiny like little a press. Kind of cover. Yeah. It's a beautiful. What made you yeah. decide to publish the book that way? What? And it's not the first time you've published a chapbook. Uh, what is it that you like about chapbooks? Well, I wanted this that book to be only that about that that experience, only that. You know, I didn't want anything else in there, and I thought it'd be perfect to put it in just a small thing. And, and, and a guy I know here in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, ha- has a small press, and he says, "Hey, man, I would love to do." He had said to me at various times, "I would, I would love to do, you know, something of yours, like." A small book of yours or some kind and i thought here it is this is exactly what i what i what, what i seems to be ordered for a small press for it. so so he made i think like 60 copies of it and, and maybe we do another set sometime but right now there's just a few left you know yeah. um but i just love the idea that it would just be a few things and people would have it and some people would enjoy it and, you know and and some people read it and think, God, this dude is crazy, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, man, I just thought it would be nice to have a just to have a collection that was simply about the encounter between these beings from a very distant galaxy and and us, this very young species, because people forget we are really young as a as a kind of creature, and. We are not anywhere near, you know, finished with our potential. And I and that also gives me some hope, even though things look pretty bleak right now. Yeah. Well, it's just it's a, it was a pleasure. I'm honored to have a copy and it was a pleasure just to read because it was so surprising and then fun. And then it turns in toward, you know, the, the political and social concerns a lot of your work addresses, too, yeah. through that lens. Yeah. So it's a really, yes. really interesting project. I loved it. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. I always think I always worry that people are going to think I'm just crazy or something. So <laughs> well, I appreciate well, that. Well, same you... here, I guess. But that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so let's close out. I want to take up more of your time, but, you know, we're running out. Do you want to read one more poem uh, from this book or from something? else what do you want to well, i'll tell you what with? you know what the the newest poem i've written is that one the poem had started to believe it's one of those poems in which the poem itself is a character oh mm-hmm. yeah it's the poem had started to believe i sent you that right um let me let me uh, started. i thought i saw it one second let me sorry 
Oh, the poem had started to believe. Yeah, there we go. Yes. Okay. They yeah, were in the alphabetical order, so it came believe. under T's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is, um, this is a, the, it has an epigraph of, by Danny Solis, who was a great spoken word poet. You can find, probably find him on YouTube, too. He was a friend of mine, and he passed away very suddenly uh, last fall. And uh, I had been talking to him like 10 days before he, he just died. He went to bed one night and just didn't wake up. Hmm. And, uh, but he was a great spoken word artist. And one of his poems was, was a, um, uh, imagined him in, in conversation with Che Guevara. And, uh, and one of the last lines, if not the last line of the poem is spoken by Guevara. And he says, welcome to the revolution, cabron meaning cabron me is not a flattering term you know it's a, probably like you know you, you idiot or you ass or whatever um and uh that's from danny's and so i thought here's a poem here's a poem in which the, some something revolutionary is is being contemplated uh the best i can say it i'll just let the poem do the work <laughs> anyway so this is again a poem in which the poem itself is a character The poem had started to believe that what's wrong with the world cannot be fixed, cannot be stopped, no matter what the poem proposes, no matter how hard the poem sweats. The sky swims with crocodiles. Every day the daylight shrinks like a cheap shirt. Nothing fits, the poem mutters. I do not fit in this world. Imagine an octopus in a t-shirt, a brontosaurus in skinny jeans, the poem's brain, a firestorm crammed into a snow globe. I came here for grasshoppers, for gingerbread and the mellow smell of cedar, for love with all its soulful incantations, for poetry, preemptive, impolite, polyphonic, and for kisses, latent, lavish, salacious, kisses, long as an opera. But what do I get? Chronic stupidity, bad religions, and bigotry by the boatload. Half the world worked to death, the other half hungry, politicians bouncing on the laps of lobbyists while the rich try to stifle their giggles. I have put up and put up. the poem smacks its head, its, its hair nappy and matted, its fingernails cracked. The poem had studied the rules, applied for better verbs, maintained its soft growl of restrained aggravation, that spritz of semi-ecstatic wonder but now it knows. It's just a minstrel show, a silly soft shoe, jazz hands, obsequious and degrading. They treat us like fluff, the poem sneers, like the dandruff of the headless. What's with all this backbiting about big time publication? I remember my first line the sharp tang of truth on my tongue, the shuffle of days before they were named. Who hogtied me to these pages? I am the child of pagans and poltergeists, of Zulus and the Comanche. I am the soul's paella, all the moans of every Friday night. You who have paved this stolen land, played this broken story, poured this comfy quicksand for the heart. Beware. I was not born to make peace with you or for your sake. It's time the people knew, time the spirits scrambled for the wind to remember and the fists to sing. I dream with red ants and wolves, with clownfish and corn snakes. I am better weather and bright wings for Gaza for South Side, South Side Chicago, Cheyenne River, and the Sahel. As prophesied by no one, I have risen again like a welt after the lash, like a dandelion 
from the forehead of a cyclops, like a horde of locusts after the field is bare. Go tell it. Uh, what a great poem to close on. That was the poem it started to believe. Uh, Tim Siebel, thanks so much for being a guest. Really, it's been a pleasure talking to you and so much fun going through your books this weekend. I yeah. uh, really enjoyed it and uh, really glad to have you here. Thanks, man. And, and I realize now that that draft I just read from is probably newer than the draft I sent you. So there might have been some differences that you noticed. I mean, I was, oh, no, I didn't give him the, the most the most recent draft. No, nah, it's all yeah. good. And cool people can look through and with a fine tooth yeah. comb and see the changes you might have uh, made. That's real, always fun, a, too. A, a real pleasure, Tim. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your interest in what I try to do as a, as a, as a poet. And uh, it's lovely to be uh, connected to Rattle. And I've always admired what was in those pages. And I'm just grateful. Well, yeah, grateful you too. Don't be a stranger. Uh, glad to have you. Have a great night. Oh. All right, pal. Yep. Take care. See ya. Yep. And that was uh, Tim Siebel's once again. His newest book, his newest full-length book, I should say, is uh, Voodoo Libretto. Um, his most recent chat book we were talking about is uh, Something Like We Did. Um, he also sent a, a copy of Fast Animal, uh, beautiful books all around by Tim Siebel. Pick them up. You can find more of his work um, at the links um, below in the show notes. Now we're going to take a quick break and go to the prompt lines. And um, let's see. So did I make the slide? I think I spaced out and forgot to make the slide. So uh, we'll put up what will we put up. We'll put up Tim Siebel's picture. The prompt for this week <laughs> was to um, the prompt for this week <clears throat> was to let me pull it up. Oh, yeah. The prompt was to write a poem that focuses on a color and a scent. That was your prompt for this week. So if you have a, sh a poem like that, I'll put up, let's see. I don't put the instructions, though. Did I not make a new slide? Let's see. Well, we'll go, that's the wrong wrong prompt. But the, <laughs> how it works is email your poem to promptlines at rattle.com. Then find the Zoom link, which I'm about to deploy. That is uh, promptlines at rattle.com, all one word, promptlines at rattle.com. Then find this Zoom link momentarily. Um, here we go with that. I will paste it into the show notes on, you, on uh, YouTube and Facebook. If you'd like to join and have a poem to share, uh, click that link and join us to share the poem and email it to me. If you don't, though, the stream continues. So sit tight right where you are, and I will be right back with more poetry. And again, that's not the, the right prompt this week, but, but anyway. We're back. Thanks for your patience. And like I said, the prompt for this week was not the one showing on the slide because I forgot to put the make a new thing, which I made a whole note about and I still... I well, know. who could think when you're talking to Tim Siebel's? It was so good. That's I true. loved every second of that interview. Well, well, thank you. Well, hopefully I'm not making slides while doing this. <laughs> yeah, hopefully <laughs> not. That's a good point. But it is true. But the prompt for this week was, I can put it on the screen over here. Mm -hmm. The prompt was to... Nope, I'm hearing some feedback. Hang on. Who's? Okay. Yeah, we'll put it on screen right here. The prompt was to uh, write a poem that focuses on a color and a scent. 
And so uh, where did you go with that poem, Katie? Well, I went to my favorite color, which uh-huh. is definitely purple and has been for quite some time. So I felt like you have to go to your favorite color, right? So I don't know if that's where <laughs> you went, but that's where I naturally went. And I just thought about at first, like, well, what smells purple? And came up with this poem, which is a sonnet minus one. I think I did that last week, too. This one is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek sonnet minus one. Because the plum was eaten. Spoiler alert. (laughs) Before I read the poem. Okay. Okay. When I tell you to eat purple, you can already feel a just washed plum in your palm, alarmingly bald, the opposite of a well toupeed peach. But back to the poor plum, all he has is a scent so faint, I have to stretch my limbs out to reach the edge of the pool to pluck the floating purple ladder for us. Catch this odd beach ball, I this little plum rolling in my fist. How many years since you got purple stuck in your teeth like this? And how many plums does one even get to pop in a lifetime? No time for apologies, but bake no mistake. You and I are just as faint, just as jellied inside and often disappointing, just as obviously bruised. Still, the purple scent has wrapped around us again. Feel that? He's shaking us up on the branch. Now it's dusk. He pulls us back to this purple world, his pitted cheeks screaming that he picked us. Uh, great poem. When I tell you to eat purple, I love I love that line about the uh, the but bake no mistake. <laughs> Thanks. I was really expecting somebody to be like, "Did you know there's a typo in your poem?" But I didn't get that. And I actually I posted this in the Prompt Lines Facebook group, and then I actually did a re-edit and changed quite a bit of it, trying to make it more active and more in the moment. And the danger in doing that is that you always misread one of the words that you. <laughs> I did too, and I knew I would. (laughs) But what did you come up with? Okay, so my poem, um, as you know, we went to the zoo yesterday, and I was sort of inspired by the zoo. My favorite animals at the zoo were these really fun birds who had, they were having a good time at the old aviary. (laughs) And so, uh, so I wrote this. Let's, uh, let's read it. This is um, Annual Pass. Let me get out of this right now. Annual Pass. He looked down and noticed his shirt was green, Oro Pendola green, the same green as the chests of the most exotic birds at the exotic bird sanctuary, though elsewhere they were as common as the common crow. Right then they were flocking at the edges of the Amazon, and in Alaska, eagles lined the limbs of the trees like old men passing the time. They were a nuisance, the guide said, and he wished he could shoot them, their droppings dropping like bombs as they plucked all the pets to the sky. Better seen than smelled flamingos. So that's, <laughs> that's great. That is the uh, hyben of the week. So thanks for uh, thanks for listening to that one. I like the repetition a lot. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, because the uh, I think green or pendulum. Yeah, green you were is a great you color. were very taken by those birds. They were super cool. <laughs> they, were. they were. They I thought they were really cool to start with. Uh-huh. Then I learned that they built these uh, they built these huge nests, mm-hmm. which are like actually weave like a basket, mm-hmm. and then that they uh, have this crazy call that's mm-hmm. just uh, really fascinating and you can hear for miles. So and now a hyphen in their honor written by Timothy nice Green. So yeah, there you go. Good. So I enjoyed those birds. Uh, anyway, let's see uh, what else we have. And uh, first in line this week is none other than Dick Westheimer. Hey, Dick, how are you doing? Muted. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, well, it was silence. So you did a good job there. Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. It was already good. Um, so, uh, so what do you have for us? Well, um, I had I had a real well I have a hard time with a lot of these prompts, but I had I had a scent all week, and it wasn't this more it wasn't until this morning that a um, that a color entered the poem. I kept writing about the scent, writing about the scent, and you know taking notes about it, and then uh, this morning a color just appeared. So we'll we'll see, we'll see how that works out in this poem. Well, sounds good. And, yeah. And the ti- and the title I think will get some reworking before I send it to uh, uh, my one of my favorite publishers or we'll, curators. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hear it. Thanks, Dick. Okay. What I learned from the weavers of Vida nu- Nueva. What is louder than the neighbors' guns popping bottles off fence posts by the barn? What is brighter than the sunlight rising behind our bedroom's blacked-out shades? 
What is more pleasant than the scent that wafts from our week's old bed sheets, sweet like mildly fermented cheese, brie, I think. What I am asking is, do these smell like the color of love, like those conchilla set shells ground and simmered by the women we met in Oaxaca, who wove carmine red rugs, whose men abandoned the trade, left them there waiting for pennies sent from a sent from husbands and sons above a younger one points north el otro lado the other side estados unidos the others nodded pointed to us showed us how they dyed the yarn red from beetle bones gentled yellow from lichen and pea and from pomegranate made a green the color of cactus leaves their looms clacked in a regular beat Hanks of yarn hung like bra the braided pelts of stars over pegs in the barn. The elder woman, Vieta Nueva, showed us rugs, including one I stand on now by our bed, the color of love, louder than the neighbor's guns, sweet as the scent of sheets remembering sleep, warmer than the sunlit shades. Wow, that's a beautiful wow. poem, Dick. What yeah. a journey. I feel like we just took a trip in that poem. <laughs> yeah, wow. we definitely did. Yeah, beautiful, Dick. Yeah, well, thanks so much. Appreciate, uh, I appreciate Tim Squared today, too. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks. Somebody Tim said a, a verbatim. Tim to the power of two. <laughs> a collective I, I still I vote that. for a tambourine of tins. Tambourine that was my vote. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, appreciate y'all and can't wait to hear the other poems. Yep, thanks as always, Dick. Good to see you. Thanks, bye. It was Dick Westheimer with what I learned from the weavers of Vida Nueva. Um, next in line is uh, Susan Talley. See if we can get. Yeah, there's Susan. Hey, Susan. Let's see if there's a reverb. Can you hear me? It's good. I think we got it perfect That's this good. time. Good. Yeah. And you guys look so clear. <laughs> Take a lovely picture. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, we have a new. We used to have a terribly bad zoom cam here and we've upgraded this to a conference good. yeah really good. yeah okay oh, well thanks i appreciate it thank you so uh, what do you have to share i sent in a poem uh-huh it says sense sense and color uh-huh it senses prompt okay so why don't you go ahead and read it is it there yep i have it yep oh you mean okay oh yeah you okay. have to have your copy up yeah no problem susan it's okay Okay, it might have um, had too many spaces in it because it just happened that way and I apologize. Oh, no problem. Autumn sweeps summer that old postcard into piled leaves, russet and brisk, no longer green, languid, crisp. Oh, wait a minute, no longer green, languid, crisp and slightly citrus, the crunch of leaves we shuffle through an earthy musk we shift back to yearly routines. Oh, nice turn at the end of the yearly routines. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, it was a Susan Talley. And uh, next, let's go to um, Nate Jacob. Good evening to you. Hey, Nate, great to see you. It's better to see you two. Aww. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I uh, I went on a hum humble brag sort of. I went on a cruise with my wife last week on oh, a nice. ship named yeah. named Bliss. Wow, wow. that's and, the ship uh, to do it on. Wow. <laughs> I wrote about bats. Um, the color I chose is not approved by my children. They say <laughs> white is not a color. <laughs> so we. Are. Oh, yeah, and then the smell arguments. I went with. Was uh, the scent I went with was sugar, mm. and they say that's not a that's a taste. <laughs> but you know, we're gonna play with it. That's great. Okay, well let's hear it. <laughs> All aboard the good ship Bliss. All last week I was better dressed and fed than usual, carried away by the everywhere smell of sugar and sweets more than my normal self would be, floating along on a white ship full of like-minded fools who believed that the luxuries of stark, bright linen dining halls, the faux wooden pillars and alabaster columns are sure signs that the up-down rocking 
boat's floors, our heaven's intent to elevate you above the white sky, above the poor, the damned, the landlubber masses. Sun-tanned and home again, our sweet, pasty, blonde kids seem happy that we have returned, though the dog was, to my humble estimation, far more demonstrative. <laughs> and now, as usual, I am sitting in our ivory car, surrounded by the hoary tundra of deep winter, waiting at the curb while my daughters rehearse their dance numbers, breathing deep the sugar beet factory's powdery plume, the smell of home, the sweet rotting scent of molasses. This is my ebb and my flow, the stable floor I live high upon. This is the ultimate level I care to ever reach out for. This is my paradise I find in the light of weekend dawns. And this will do just fine. Let the ship sail without me. Oh, that's mm. great. So where'd you go, Nate? Where was the cruise to? Uh, well, we left, we left to L.A. Uh -huh. And it was cold. <laughs> and we went down to Cabo, and it was cold. And then we came back up to Ensenada, and it was actually too cold for them to dock. Oh, so wow. we went to Cabo. Uh, <laughs> I used to live near Ensenada, actually. And it was cold. So, yeah, I went there only when oh, really? it was warm, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I bet it feels I've warm now been. compared oh. to... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now it's warm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, very fun poem, as always. Yeah, thanks so much, Nate. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I do have to agree with Nate's kids. That, that, uh... I, I agree with Nate. I will defend him. <laughs> yep. It certainly sugar? felt like sugar had a smell in that poem. He made it happen, okay? <laughs> he made it happen? Okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> if you say so you are the the cook of the yes team, mm -hmm. so. okay <laughs> um now let's go on to uh, uh tr paulson is here hey tr are you there you try and unmute i can see yeah <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, TR, we'll, we'll check back with you in a second, and we'll go to Mike Bales next. Oh, I got it. Oh, TR got it. Wait, hang on, Mike. <laughs> TR's Technical. got it. Hey, Technical TR. Detail. Yeah, no detail. problem. No problem at all. <laughs> so it's great to see you, too. Yeah. Um, so I, I have, I sent two, but maybe one of them might be a little bit long. I don't know. Um, so one of them, I got three publications this week, which is not usual. I, it's... I, Dry, long dry spell followed uh -huh. by three publications in 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 the same week. Well, congratulations! And, um, yeah, I sent two of them. I sent my one from Gulf Coast, which was actually originally a current events poem from 2020, in response to the Jupiter Saturn conjunction. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those poems I'm grateful it was rejected because I uh, then I had a chance to make it better. So I think the version that it's not tweaked a lot, but it's tweaked enough that it really works. Mm -hmm. And it ended up in Gulf Coast, and who can complain about that? And the other one is um, in um, a sort of low, I don't know if it's local, but it's out. It's based out of Rockland, California. It's called the West Trestle Review, mm -hmm. and um, they do a really good job with the stuff they publish. So, and it actually was originally a prompt poem. Oh, very cool. Well, congratulations on both. Yeah, um, yeah I think, uh, what was the prompt? Do you remember? Because this is the prompt lines now. I don't know if you saw the transition. but we're instead Yeah, of open, so is it just prompt It is just or? prompts, yeah. But we'll let it slide, of course, because we want to hear your poems. Um, <laughs> so which one Which one was a prompt poem? Let's read that if you can remember the prompt. <laughs> okay, the letter, of, letter from the Tower of London from the West Trestle, Trestle is the prompt poem. Uh-huh. And, and, and what's... The the prompt was write a poem, pick a poem that's written in a foreign language that you don't know, mm -hmm. and then write the poem based write a poem based strictly on how the poem sounds. Oh yeah, yeah, I that, loved was it. that was a fun, a fun one. one. Yeah, yeah, I remember was, that. yeah, great. So I liked the energy of it. Of course, it didn't make sense, and um, so I moved it towards making sense. And then I eventually workshopped it, and my and I still didn't know what it wanted to be about. And one of the this I'm I came I do Kim Anesia workshops and one of my um, classmates said, "Well, it sounds like it's Game of Thrones type stuff." <laughs> and then another one said, "Well, watch the Tudors and and make it about King Henry VIII." So I played with both and ended up I ended up geeking out over King Henry VIII and learning a lot about him and um, so that's that's what this poem ended up being. So 
yay prompts and yay workshops and yay the yay for the whole process. Yeah, it sounds All like right. quite a process. Yeah, yeah, I love the tutors too. I watch the whole the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't very it's somewhat historical accurate, yeah. but accurate but they they play loose and fancy with a yeah, lot of Yeah, that's why that. I watched it. Well, that's the best kind, <laughs> loose and fancy. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hear it, TR. Letter from the Tower of London. Um, I'll skip the um epigraph cuz I just explained it. You stole my title, my king, even my horse, while you strung violets in my hair, one by one. You cinched my late, my waist with lace corsets, craved, craved my purple on your nails, and you won him when his son broke and born in me. You toasted my sister's banishment, my brother's rise to scaffold. Now crows circle like severed ghosts beyond my window. My hair hangs to disguise the things you say I am, six-fingered, crooked as broth and teeth. There is too much dividing. Thoughts like blades. I'll hand over my books if you can read my chestnut filly, my riding dresses, my crown, my heavy pickle of a man, his neck like a badger's war torn. Tomorrow I die. Too many tomorrows. The Frenchman's sword delayed again. Time sings like sparrows outside. I dare you to reach up. Try to take those songs from me. Try to grasp the clouds. Stormy soft among the stars. The dark lifts me. I wait more beautiful than ever. Oh, I love that. Mm. I love where it came from. You know, yeah. that it came from such a strange place as a mm -hmm. mistranslating that translation. Yeah, that's fascinating. And then came out from all that. Yeah, really cool backstory. Thanks mm -hmm. for sharing that. And I think we should yeah. probably, yeah, thanks, TR. Yeah, and I think we should probably make it a regular thing. If you have an older prop poem, yeah. um, definitely, you know, that you finished or published somewhere. Yeah, especially published. That was exciting. Yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, thanks thanks so much, TR. It's great to see yeah. you. I'm sorry I didn't really know what the rules no, were anymore. No. Yeah, that's okay. When you're doing things for years, then you make yeah. a shift. You know, <laughs> it, there's a there's a delay in everybody mm -hmm. catching the shift. But we did a couple months ago decide to, to stick to the prompts. Yeah. Yeah. But awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Always great to see you. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, it's T.R. Paulson with a great poem, Letter from the Tower of London. I think that prompt was back in like May or mm -hmm. sometime, but it was a lot yeah, of fun. Well, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go next to, uh, next in line is Joe Cottonwood. Hey, Joe. Okay. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. great. Hear you and see yeah. you. Good to see you. Good deal. Uh, it, it was interesting hearing Tim Siebel's talk about the first poem, uh, how he was driving through woods and just had to stop or maybe was walking but the, the, this poem came kind of about the same way it, i was just walking through woods and suddenly this memory from nowhere i mean well from way back just hit me and, and that was i i, I relate to <laughs> his experience <laughs> Yeah, that's a great, great source of poetry when that happens. It's because yeah, a poems tend to be something your subconscious is trying to tell you. Yeah. And so when that pops up in your head, it's worth writing about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. Anyway, this is called Thin Ice. Okay. Do you have it? Yep, have it up. Okay. okay. Thin Ice. My daughter Lily asks why I bought plain chapstick when she specifically asked for cherry. Cherry, Dad! <laughs> and I don't answer because Carol's 13th birthday ice skating party on the CNO Canal. I'm 12, the only guest. Barely know her. Different schools. Carol has scars from a cleft lip. Speech a little weird. Smile is rare. A heart shape sideways shiny and red laughter unknown parents are friends carol races me she's faster but stops with an icy spray i glide past to the sound of creaking cracking like frozen bolts of lightning and i'm in water piercing my core like an electric shock somehow have the wits to bend forward so only my legs go through my torso flat on a breaking slab, grasping for a grip when Carol's hand reaches and I clamber out saying, I'm okay, I'm not even cold, because I'm not yet. But somebody throws a blanket around me and says, take off your skates and socks and pants. So I strip while everybody is watching, 
Carol is watching in the parking lot. We all wish Carol a happy birthday. Like her mom and dad kiss her cheeks. Then my mom and dad kiss her forehead. So wearing a blanket like a skirt, missing signs, not knowing rules. I kiss her shiny red lips. Her eyes fly open. Her open hand presses the front of my skirt. Blood rushes. Parents can't see. My entire body snaps to attention. Her chapstick is soft, sticky, scent of cherry. My heart, a newly opened door. Happy birthday, I say. Thanks, Carol says. Sorry, I tell my daughter. <laughs> Cherry, she says. Next time, try to remember. <laughs> that was great. What a wonderful memory. I love the, the voice of the daughter, too. Great, great uh, sense of that flashback. Yeah, that was yeah. really captivating. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and two, I think it's important to point out, you know, um, when it's cold here, mm -hmm. like it's, it's cold right now in so many places that aren't used to be cold. Yeah. Don't go on the ice, man. Yeah. Like up in Wrightwood, um, every year there's this little pond. Oh, people come up from LA and fall in, and the you know people have died like wow. every maybe once every four or five years someone dies up there. They yeah. put all the ropes around it, but uh, everywhere right now where it's cold, so maybe that saved a life that poem too, Joe. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the memory came up. But yeah. thanks so much for sharing it. Okay. Yep. Take care. It was a Joe Cottonwood with Thin Ice, and uh, next let's go to Zachary Honeycutt. Hey, Tim and Katie. How's hey, it going? Zach. Hey, Yeah, great. <laughs> okay. So I was not on last week. Uh, are we doing one poem tonight? Um, one? Well, yeah, I think so. It's, it's still one. Ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Unless they're like super short is one poem. And I don't know if you're um, ever... Zachary you... tries to sell you on it. That's it. You <laughs> open a door for him. And he walks through it. <laughs> he can convince you anything. <laughs> I always consider. I mean, I want to hear more. I but... know we always want to, but... But we got to stick yeah, to Yeah, we do. Yeah. But yeah. The second poem, sure. What if I read the second one first? And then if you guys... If I read it quick enough, you guys let me read the first one. The first one's just a villanelle, so they're both pretty short. They're not that bad. All right. <laughs> well, see, a villanelle, as far as Katie... It's concerned especially. It's yeah. a pretty long poem. <laughs> it's a long, it's an epic length. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll read the second one. I'll read I'll read the second one. And then if you guys you guys you guys give me the yay or nay, but I'll read the, the second, second one. one is really short. Any double space or like almost double. All right, Zachary, honey cut. <laughs> you make the cut this time. Okay, you've got the ruling. Why not? <laughs> Next week though. <laughs> we're gonna be strict again. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. You guys should change it up. Strict one week and then not strict the next week. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, okay. I'll put that in the recommendation, John. <laughs> not a red scent from the dog. Was with my dad. Smelled something bad. As the door opened, saw an older woman dressed to dine who brought with her this raggedy dog not dressed to dine. Why does she need to bring him right now? He's a cheapskate. He won't pay later when the bill comes. Droned my father, why does anyone need to bring a dog with them to a restaurant in this town? Replied I, it'd be worse if the dog brought her. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice setup and punchline kind of yeah. poem there. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. That was yeah. really fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Let's right. let's hear the villanelle. It is. Yeah. And it rhymes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a nice little villanelle by Zachary Honeycutt okay. in and faded there. Yeah. Okay. Man in the sky. He climbs down from heaven a little while. Down rungs of the ladder he has to hold. You can't trust what color he paints his bile. Look up at him, but you won't see him smile. He clings to a ladder he feels he holds. He climbs down from heaven for a little while. Undressed my boss's advice like an old style. He left his brush because he thought it would hold. 
You can't trust what color he paints his bile. One day he planned on outrunning my mile, said I, running shoes are awkward to hold. He climbs down from heaven for a little while, babbling a language that's gone out of style. Let him have his fun, he's getting so old. You can't trust what color he paints his bile. Looks down at you, don't lose sleep for his guile. He shoves around the weight he doesn't hold. He climbs down from heaven for a little while. You can't trust what color he paints his bile. Oh, really interesting yeah. poem with the colors moving through too. <laughs> Those are exactly. such different poems to have written in a week. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, silly and serious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, thanks so much. And that might come, uh, no, Villanelle might, another example here. Yeah. For, we'll see if that comes we'll in handy later. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thanks, Zachary. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, nice to see All you guys right. again. Care. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. Yeah, there's two Bye. poems by Zachary Honeycutt, but don't make a habit of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay next let's go to um let's go to carolyn cod next hello hi carolyn hi. yeah great to see hi. you um i also have two poems ah, okay it's partly because last week i sent in the the one and i couldn't get connected on zoom mm -hmm. and then i did happen to write a, a one for this week oh that's but, great well these are two are the these are two are plenty one, short. They would always yeah, be fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Fairly, yeah. One is very short. Yeah. And the first one is actually, um, it's how I feel about prompts. So it's not, <laughs> I call it an improper prompt poem. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. Let's and hear it. it's a little bit of a tongue twister also. Uh -huh. so. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward. Let's go. <laughs> I'm not a very prompt person, possibly for appointments. Yes. Usually on time. But generally, promptness and processing prompts promptly is not my thing. Probably because I'm prone to probe profusely before I'm ready to proceed with the production of anything, especially a poem. However, at times, a sudden thought or even an external prompt can provoke the promise of a proper prompt poem. But also, proceeding from a dream or from a few words jotted down in the night, without pressure, an impromptu prompt poem appears. <laughs> That's great. I love the tongue twister <laughs> aspect. Yeah, very so, fun. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. So the other one is for this week, but it's also a little bit of an example of the last part of that poem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that'll uh, be fun, too. Let's hear it. So it's just called Orange. The lovely penetrating aroma of orange blossoms fills the air. In Espanol, Fragrancia de Azahares. My husband peels an orange. The delightful fragrance floats from room to room. I really like oranges, but orange isn't my favorite color. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing both those, Carolyn. Okay, thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good night. It was Carolyn Codd with um, Orange and an Improper Prompt Poem. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Okay, and next up, let's go to um, let's go. Oh, let's go to Mike Bales because we were about to go, and then we we told him no. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mike. Welcome back. Yeah, Sorry about that. Way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I failed to skip for a while. That's why it happens. Um, I sent it to you on submittable. Okay, well, let me pull it up. But tell us about tell us uh, how you how you approached it while I pull it up because I didn't have that open yet. Um, the easiest way on my. My definition of paradise is kind of my par summer cottage my parents had when we lived in Minnesota. It was nine acres, kind of away from everything. Mm -hmm. On two sides was a lake. Um, one big thing, there are also big lawn areas and some wooded areas, like going down to the lake and two of the sides of the property. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing on there, and it's kind of a metaphor of life, there's a huge lilac bush and is fully bloomed and fragrant like a month or a matter of weeks. Wow. So it went kind of went fastly, fast. So my poem was to blossom when young. Lilacs bloomed in the hedge, dappled with lavender. The air smelled sweet early June as they walked the driveway, while a breeze from the lake whispered, this is the beginning. This is what I embraced a time of ease and grace at the 
the cottage two miles out of town, and my heart said, this will last forever. While puffy clouds pass like dreams, the deep breath taken I embraced, filled with an intoxicating essence, bittersweet infatuation before summer faded. Oh, that's mm. lovely. Yeah, I've always had a special. I've always loved lilacs. Yeah, yeah. I should have gone there oh. with purple. I love the scent of lilacs. Yeah. They're like one of my favorites. Well, for me, you know, Rochester has yeah. a lilac. You know, Rochester New York has a lilac festival. Mm-hmm. So that, that was really prominent, and it was right outside my apartment. That's my first pr- apartment. I'm jealous of that. And then, uh, and then in Wrightwood, they're full of lilacs. It's wow. like lilacs and apple trees are the two things we have in Wrightwood. So wow. it's uh, so I went from one lilac place to another. So I love that. Thanks for sharing, Mike. Yeah, for about a few weeks or a month, I was intoxicated. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, that's great. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Yep, that was Mike Bales with uh, To Blossom When Young. Yeah, great, great poem there. All right, next, let's go to uh, Bishwajit Mishra. Hey, Tim. Hey, uh, Bishwajit, yeah. Just, I just screwed up something. I'm calling from the phone. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, I don't know what's going on. I, I'm at somebody's house for a house for army. Oh, that's nice. And you still came so, over. Well, I, I really appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sneak into, I don't know if the camera works. On, <laughs> it was. I did something and, uh, you know, it didn't work. But I'm going to read it. There, there are a lot of people, he, I mean, that you have there. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to. Uh, and everybody has seen me. So that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. okay. <laughs> I think yeah. I... It was working fine. I might have touched something, and I don't want to disconnect. Okay, yeah, no problem. So, so, so what's the poem? Yeah. Uh, I wrote a hyphen um, for the prompt. Uh-huh. And it's uh, it's uh, it's an after poem, uh, after a poem, uh, which I put at the bottom of the poem, because it was, everybody will know that poem. So I just people want, uh, want people to guess what is this poem I'm, uh, that's related to my poem. Uh-huh. So if that's okay... Um, when I submit, I'll put it on the top. Uh, like normally, you would just give the credit to. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds like but a fun it, game I mean, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's play. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it's another. This is the second time I've written something uh, after a poem that was read at random. Ah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I cool. can give you the read. <laughs> okay. It's called "Can You See? I Can Smell." The poem didn't show up in my inbox. I was up very early. Barely sleeping for three hours. That's not unusual. But not getting the poem until 8 a.m. was not usual. We were visiting our son. Everybody else was asleep. I needed the poem, more so as it was supposed to be a Sunday special, and I was up already. What else could I do without waking everybody else up? Finally, I caught it in the spam folder. How was that even possible? I've been receiving the daily poems for over a year <laughs> without fail. Sunday poems are poetry respond ones, which I wait for like lottery results, even when I don't have a ticket. <laughs> that the poem ending in spam seemed like a conspiracy. I know it. It's their conspiracy. The clouds, they make everything green. Mm. Then I read about this situation, the miracles. And all, of all places, in some boonies in Mexico on a Sunday? Well, what better day can there be after six days of work, at least for those poor guys living in the boonies? So we hear of the miracles. Then the counter offer to outdo, undo, or at least to match. Otherwise, folks, it's all hoax. Winter fog, smell of the burnt pond filling the house. Oh, that's wonderful. I love the haiku again. Thanks so much for sharing yeah. that. Thank and you. We'll give a moment, the... Yeah, we'll get a moment yeah. for everybody to put in their answers before ah. we were... <laughs> So I know what it is because you, uh, yeah, you sort yeah, of narrowed it down. Know. First, you narrowed it down to, um, you know, one out of seven <laughs> chances. So I knew it was a yeah. Sunday poem. And then yeah. uh, when the... Uh, <laughs> The miracles in Mexico happened. I knew it was yeah. this Sunday's poem. Um, yeah, <laughs> so does anybody remember what that was, class? <laughs> Why do I feel like I'm the only one in the class? It's not fair. Where's my team? <laughs> right. So it was Second Coming yeah. by Nicholas yeah. Montemarano. Good. Yeah, Good. excellent poem I last week. I put that at the bottom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it's so fresh. And, you know, we have talked, everybody talks about it. You don't know why a poem comes the way it comes. Mm-hmm. 
and this poem to come at a high band. I, I, I have no idea. And this happened when I didn't get that poem in my son's house. They said, what? How did that poem end up in spam? <laughs> and I kept checking, checking, checking. I thought maybe there's something wrong with uh, Rattle's uh, maybe website or the system. It's not coming. Then I went back and found it. That's why they, somebody's conspiring. Yes. Yeah, well, thanks so much <laughs> for, for rescuing for this spam. It is a little concerning. We pay a lot of money for those, Not to uh, be in the spam poems, folder. Not yeah. to be in the spam folder, yes. And, yeah. because of the su- and because of the subject of the poem, too, right? Yeah, it could be, yeah. yeah. Kind of keywords, yeah. too much, yeah. So like religious they, spam yeah. maybe yeah, triggered it. So. Yeah, I'll have to check. Uh, it does tell me how many... Uh, how many things are labeled spam oh, from the email. Right. So let's see if there was a, an unusual amount that time. Mm. But anyway, thanks so much for sharing that. And I okay. love the uh, I love the use of the hyphen. It was really yeah. nice, the, the journalistic, and then the hit you with the haiku, which are yeah. wonderful. Yeah, no surprise you're great uh, at that you. with your haiku that you post that I look forward to on Twitter. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, well, Appreciate thanks so much, Biz, and good keep night. enjoying the party, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good night, everybody. All right, take yeah. care. Hi. Yeah, it's Bishop's admission with, can you see, I can smell. <laughs> Very fun. It's fun to picture him going back out to the party. <laughs> it really is, yeah. <laughs> With his nice smile. <laughs> it definitely is. Uh, <laughs> let's go Very to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, take care. Thanks, Mr. Jit. All right. Let's okay, go bye. to uh, uh, Lori Henniger next. Hi. How hey, are hi. you? Yeah, th- thanks so much. For you. Have you been on before? I'm trying to remember. I don't think so. I have not. It's my first time. And um, I have a writing class on Monday nights. And so it's the timing doesn't work. And so we're on a break. And it's just really nice to be able to be here in person. That's wonderful. I listen on the I listen to the podcast all the time. Uh Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad you could join. Yeah, thanks so much for doing it. I'm I'm where are you calling from? I should say too. I always like to know it's fun. From Blairstown, New Jersey. Oh, well, very nice. Never been there. Out but, here, yeah. out here in the woods, Absolutely. in yeah. in rural New Jersey, which there is rural <laughs> New Jersey. I just want to say. <laughs> well, great. So, what did you uh, write about? Um, I I used lots of colors and a little bit of smell. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, the poem is titled "Variations on a Lake." Excellent. One, cacophonous honking slaps the trees before my eyes find them. The V's of geese, over 50 forms, airborne feathered bowling pins, other groups of two or four uncooked drumsticks, walnut heads on skinny necks sloping to bulbous bodies gray, against gray sky. At the end of my road, a lake lies, a family of swans, bright white in spring and summer, raised gray broods, cygnets who fly like clumsy angels, like awkward ghosts, like wind-blown wedding gowns when grown, away to claim another lake in this county of rock and water. Yesterday, driving by burst cattails and frothy reed brass lining the liminal space between water and road, two swans floated aside a ream of geese. I wondered, was this an easy truce or grace? Two. Along the liminal edge of the lake, cattails and reed grass thrive in marshy water. In winter, they're browns pretending to be a muted landscape are demanding a search for variation subtle. In spring and summer, they seed a wide scent and spectrum weedy and wild arthritic rows, green joints knobbed, tall grass capped in creamy whiskers, purple loose strife, spikes startling as a row of erect cocks, low yellow buttercups, butter blanket, the verge, 
whip soft rush, sprout small single red and orange blooms. Down the slope, a colony of plattered leaf green skunk cabbage. Roots thrive in common soil. Roots reside in darkness, reliable underground. Upper parts collect light and senses of passers-by. Fall comes, they brown and wither, they die. Roots survive in the dark, in the wet, without notice, not an eye to find them, spread and stay alive. Uh, very vivid, love all the details, variations on a lake. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. And so glad you could join us live in person. I am too. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Well, hopefully we'll and see you next time. thanks for every week. Oh, yeah, our pleasure for sure. Yeah, thanks so much. And I hope next time there's a yeah. there's a Monday off. You can play <laughs> hooky. Come over here. <laughs> exactly. That's true too. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. Thanks so much. Bye. Yeah. That was uh, Lori Henninger with uh, Variations on a Lake. Um, let's see. Next in line, we will go to Clayton Clark. Hi, Clayton. Hi. Yeah, great to see you. Good to see you too. Um, I love hearing everyone's poems, and Tim Siebel's kind of blew my mind. That yeah, was... he's great. He's always been a favorite poet, and it was really fun when you know I had no idea. Of course, doing the poach, uh, Rattle Poetry Prize, you just pull up the name in the database, and you're like, "Oh, Tim Siebel, that's cool." I always <laughs> wish he'd send us something. So, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, so um, in you know. Supporting Nate Jacobs, actually white. It's not a color, but it's all the colors. So. <laughs> it's true. Yay. It is all the colors. He didn't get it wrong. He got it so right that he won. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. But the really the one, the sugar was the one. You can't smell yeah. sugar. I've stuck my nose in sugar before. I can smell sugar. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I swear too. Mm, Yay, so Clayton's well, on I'm my side. I'm excited. to try harder <laughs> next time. Okay. <laughs> so what did you? Yeah. So we have the white and. Uh, you have a scent too? Yeah, so I do have a scent, and I'm not just saying white because to support Nate, <laughs> I'm all white. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's hear it. All right, so aberrant winter weather. It's been strange. Wait, sorry. It's been strange. This morning, a padlocked shaped cloud broke open, an angel spilled out and struggled against the sky. It twisted in a mass of white stuff, like bridal tool or a half-open parachute, then crash-landed and tumbled on my lawn. I shivered, stared long enough to be seen as impolite. Surprised by his five o'clock shadow, he gathered his skirt and straightened. With feathers askew, a few broken, he brushed leaves and dirt from his frock. Though he smelled like road rage, I reached out, asked if he was okay, asked if he could tell me, was my brother? He closed his eyes, then opened, gave me a cynical look, tucked his hands beneath the bell sleeves, turned and ran to the trees, chasing something dark as if it were prey. I felt myself crack like an ice floe breaking away. Mm, yeah, powerful poem. I yeah. love the love the form and the subtlety of the rhymes. Yeah, the especially. rhyme makes it so, such a satisfying <clears throat> ending. Yeah. yeah, yeah, wonderful ending. Thanks so much for sharing that, Clayton. Guys, yeah, it's a yeah. great poem. Ah, thanks. Yeah. It's Clayton Clark with aberrant winter weather, something everybody can experience right now, yeah. I think. All right, let's see. Uh, next, we have uh, Lisa S. Lisa Seidenberg. Hey, Lisa. Yes, it's me. Yeah, great Hi. to Thank see you. you. Hi. Thank you. Um, Yes, well, so I have, um, I'm, I'm actually a big, big fan of the movie Oppenheimer, and mm -hmm. it had just won a whole bunch of awards at the Golden Globe, so it was kind of in my head all week, and I couldn't get it out, <laughs> and um, and so that's what my poem is, and I'm glad you like rhymes, because my poem has a lot of rhymes. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah, we uh, definitely it's, do, yeah. And what? Oh, definitely do, for sure. 
Oh, good. Well, there's no shortage. Um, they're rhyming couplets. <laughs> and it's it's brought to you by the colors jade green and uh, the smell of chemicals. And so here it is. <laughs> I love that intro. Yeah, <laughs> like <nice>. Sesame Street. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Countdown, Alamogordo, New Mexico, 1945. Morning light breaks soft over the desolate sands. Goggled heads await the countdown to commands. Four, five, four, three, two, one, and then the bomb is released, all earthly thoughts erased for that moment, at least. A deafening sound, a mushroom-like cloud in the sky, burnt chemical fumes of combustion fill lungs and eyes. Shards of jade green glass showered the desert site. A new substance they would name after scripture, Trinitite. The atom bomb test went off as planned. The scientists shook each other's hands. No one could foretell the unleashed power the small group witnessed in that early morning hour. Years later, the story would be framed on Hollywood sets, but a movie can't replay what they saw that day or capture the regrets. Yeah, great ending there too. Yeah. I mean, the rhyme just yeah. sing the ending home as really always. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It does remind me too. I really want to watch the Oppenheimer movie. Yeah, we haven't seen it. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. haven't seen it? You've got to. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. We need to. yeah I've always loved Oppenheimer. I did, a, I did a book report for him about him in like Aww. like ninth grade or something, and I didn't know he was so fascinating until that book report. And then uh, yeah, yeah. Really... well, you need to see it. It's official. Definitely now. do. Oh, absolutely. See all three hours of it. Yeah, <laughs> well, for sure. We'll break it into several nights. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you. All right, we'll take. Here. Thanks so much. And that was Elisa Seidenberg with a countdown, Alamogordo, New Mexico, 1945. Um, next in line is none other than Guy Chambers. Hello, Guy. Hello there. How's it going? Yeah, great. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to be back again. So I've been waiting for a while here. Yeah. Although I've just been hibernating here the last four days. Yeah, well, here. if it's this cold down here in Texas, <laughs> I bet it is yeah. really cold where you are. Yeah, yeah. It was been minus 50 here. Oh, my gosh. Wow. It's been the one of the worst Like the temperature or like the wind chill? Oops. That's with the wind chill. Everything else, the temperature's been around minus 40 in that. Yeah, it's, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I was, there was uh, one time when I was a kid, it came down over Lake Ontario, mm -hmm. and it was minus 25 or so. And I just remember you step outside, and, like, everything, yeah. like, in your nose freezes. I can't in, even like, imagine. one second. I really it's like, yeah, ah! <laughs> Just can't, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah they like closed say, schools just, and everything. It was, it was yeah. intense. But oh, yeah, negative like 40, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's 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 cold, you know. Yeah. It even gets past there. You just get so cold, it doesn't matter. I just stay inside, and that's it. Well, I don't blame you. <laughs> I'm glad you're staying inside. Yeah, definitely. Good, good job. Oh yeah, yeah. it's starting to warm up. Today is minus twenty eight. Oh, so it's balmy. <laughs> get your swim trunks <laughs> ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ready to get on the, the right. get the on the deck here. Just <laughs> All right, so what do you got for us today? Yeah, I was just going to mention about tonight there, and also when uh, Tim was talking about Jimi Hendrix and all that, mm -hmm. and uh, actually, I was sure noticing in the, in the chat there, see, there's a lot of people, J Hendrix fans still out there, and, and uh, actually, to, when I started really writing poems, I got really interested in poetry with Jimi Hendrix, some of his poems he has. Oh, yeah. There's one, oh, wow. there's one, yeah, there's one poem on the, his album, uh, Band of Gypsies, there's a poem that he written in the back. There's no name title to it, but I just got right there. I go, wow! I like wow. to write like that. Yeah, That's to check that really out. got me sure. inspired. And everything yeah. else, so yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, for this poem here, I got I written about a color, but I didn't get the scent in there. The not too there, and there's a trigger word at near the end there. I don't know if you if you can be able to read it or not. That's one word there. Oh, I never it's fine. Really... Don't worry about it. I see it. it yeah. uh, it's a, it's, an, it's a pro, program for adults, so we're all Yeah, like, <laughs> like I said, like I usually don't write some stuff like that, but... Uh, I yeah, it, it's me, past 10 p.m. on the East Coast, so the, yeah. <laughs> the sensors are all right. We could yeah, show but a to me, it had, it, show. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I know sometimes you get words like that. Sometimes it, it does have to get the, get the proper meaning out of the poem mm -hmm. here. Okay. okay, so this one I call Pan Flash. Hmm. Gravy gray, clairvoyant slant, broad sheet, daily words, cast stones at the feet from the newspaper stand. Pictures gray to sway the say, ink so somber, filling with lost sack shadows. Pan 
flash, time re rehash, treachery, scenery, spidery thievery, moments of fame, moments of downfall, mankind, colorblind, finger pointing, one eye on the fence line, <clears throat> chest nickels flipping in the air, and bezel thoughts to the beanstalk talk. If you walk this way, others walk the other way. Some stop to think what one read or is just on one point of view. I staring at the gray daily words. Reason the same, wondering, what the fuck next? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was worth it at the end, guy. And I can yeah, hear the Hendrix in there, too, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I can but, really yeah, see the Hendrix Kato. connection now that you've told us. Now I'm going to see it every week. I'm excited. Yeah, I think so. That's oh, yeah, Kato like style. Said, like a, yeah, like I always did, like, a, just some of his poems that comes out and say, wow, mm -hmm. I like that style and everything else. So it kind of follows that way, sort of the way that, too. Well, very yeah. cool. Well, thanks, guy. Always a pleasure. And stay warm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Stay yeah, we will. Yeah. <laughs> All right, take care. <laughs> It was like Guy Chambers with Pan Flash. All right, next, uh, Laura Berg. Hi. Hey, Hi. Laura. Yeah, how are you doing tonight? Good. Um, I'm enjoying it so much. Aw. Um, the smell and the, the color for me, it happened to be the cleaning fluid for the floor. Oh, that's a vivid it memory. That's kind of the, the new version of the... You know, the scents that bring you back somewhere that really does. Yeah. <laughs> it was fabuloso. So I um, wrote this prose poem called Doing the Work. Okay. My husband mops the house with two times concentrated fabuloso, flexes his biceps as he squeezes the mop, inhales the lavender oil, gazes into great purple spurts of soap as they swirl into hot water. He's posed the bulging bottle on the island where it glistens as hands on hip, he hollers, I'm the king of floors. I flutter, concerned he might pour his fabuloso on wood instead of pine sole or on travertine instead of real stone cleaner, but you don't see me picking up that mop. A kind son, he'd be the only one of four to help his mother, no daughters, when she'd pour her Judy cleaner, the Tunisian brand, and scrub hands on, no gloves. Which brings me to my own mom with her Mr. Clean and Dufold self-bringing mop. Once I traveled home early on spring break, opened the kitchen door and found her scrubbing on hands and knees. My PhD mother in penitential pose, cleaning a house by then too big, too porous, too old for aging parents. There's what we remember and what we're game to do, cavorting around each other. My daughter calls to complain about it. Don't worry, you'll work it out. Oh, I love that. Yeah, definitely the way that scent brings it back, the memory. Yeah, thanks so much for yeah, sharing that's that, really Laura. fascinating. I really, the way you wove that story around different cleaners is so interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Laura. Thank you. Yep, have night a good night. Bye. There's uh, Laura Berg with Doing the Work. And uh, last but not least, for sure, is uh, Brian O'Sullivan. Hey, Brian. Hey, Hi. how are you both? Yeah, Hi. great to see you. Great to be here. Actually, a really good day because tomorrow is the first day of classes, but I'm I'm on sabbatical, so uh -huh. I've been having a really good time not planning for classes tomorrow and <laughs> out nice. the window and writing a poem about the first snow of the winter too. Oh, so that's was, great. How long is the sabbatical? How long, long do you get off? I just took one semester. Get uh -huh. paid more that way. Oh, that's um, great. But it's going to be a great semester. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it is, I have yeah. a feeling. Yeah. I wonder what happens if I went on a sabbatical. I don't know. <laughs> <We're> all... <laughs> we all do that. So. <laughs> all right. Well, so what do you have for us? Okay. So uh, it's called Edna O'Brien's Snow Globe. Um, and it was, I was looking out the window this morning. I saw the snow falling. And I started thinking about this. Um, from across the room and through the blinds, I can barely see the winter's first snow. Just a hazy shimmer. But when I try to focus my eyes on it, the gray parking lot transforms into a charmed day. Jen says the snow is softly sifting like a snow globe. And as I breathe in the spicy, earthy scent of the alu gobi she's making, I wonder if there was 
boxy cooking in Kenturk 90 years ago with my Aunt Kay's friend Edna from pharmacy school. She of the one earring and the artsy ways showed off the snow globe she brought back from France. And little Maeve grabbed it gleefully. It rolled out of her fingers and crash, water and right specks of denatured fantasy and bits of crystal spread everywhere. My mother never stopped feeling bad about that. And I wanted her to be glad when I told her that I'd met Edna at a reading she gave. And she only remembered Kay and not that day. But by then there were too many cracks or no, not enough cracks left in the crystal shell around my mother's world to let news of the gray world seep in. And, the only, and she only stared through me and I smiled a vague smile while the haze behind her eyes whirled and brewed into a quiet whiteout. Uh, yeah, really, I love the way all these poems today have moved back through memory yeah, with this, this yeah. sense, especially. It just always does that. It's amazing how uh, how much how connected we are. It's a great memory. Thanks for bringing that back, yeah, thank Brian. You. Enjoy your sabbatical. You. Yeah, definitely. You. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> all right. Well, take care. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Yeah, it's Brian O'Sullivan with uh, Edna O'Brien's Snow Globe. And uh, let's see. So, uh, do we have a, a Ted? Yeah, we have, do have a Ted Guevara poem, and we have a Nivedita poem, too. Oh. <clears throat> and I think Nivedita, um, does she say anything about that? Well, well, we'll read it. Let's see. So, um, she says, my best friend, what would she say? Um, yeah, she's asking us to read it on her behalf. So, we go ahead. My best friend. This is what how it starts here. My best friend. There we go. Oops, let's switch to the other view too there we go okay <laughs> so i'm looking at you we have, we have multiple cameras here by the way and i only noticed while talking to tim that i shouldn't have put that camera uh, i should have like put it over there because i was like trying to look at tim in a way that he would see i was looking at me you gotta... i just try to pretend they're not there there's weird black yeah. boxes <laughs> <laughs> there's that too well anyway okay so my best friend um from it a frying pan from it, I launched myself into the fire, watched the bright blue flames of the LPG gas stove devour desperately the feminine act of cooking. Oh, very interesting there. I was never the girl who played house with a cooking set and dolls, nor with ca cars or bikes or books were it for me. They were docile demons who could carry me on the back of a hippogriff <laughs> or vault me straight into the Queen of Hearts croquet lawn. Books still are it for me. We have that kind of relationship, the one where the book decides how long we'll stay together. <laughs> and when we do part, I cherish the moments, the moments it helped me grow, the moments it shared its biblio bibliosma, bibliosmia, the moments it gave me peace, the moment it taught me to hope. So parting is not such sweet sorrow after all, but a chance to reminisce about old friends and make room for new acquaintances. Mm. Very interesting. I love that uh, about the, the book deciding how long we'll stay together. Yeah, that's, that's really funny. It's so <laughs> accurate. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Nivy. And then um, next, let's go to uh, the Ted Guevara poem. And uh, Ted had this. Um, and, oh, the picture first. Don't forget the picture. Okay, so Ted sent a picture like he always does. And the picture here is this. Uh, so it's a rolled up page, a, a printer, a print copy of a painting, would you say? I would say it's a scrolled painting looking thing with angels on it. And it looks almost like a votive, like it could hold a candle maybe. Oh, it could be yeah. f more firm than I expected. Okay, yeah, yeah I see. Very interesting. Well, there's angels here might be relevant. Okay, let's see the poem. And we have Phenom. Color of a scent in her young voice, operatic, exists. It doesn't anywhere else. How can a scent have a color? Maybe spruce snaps the hue of dark teal. You break branch and the whiff of late Christmas goes jamming up your nostrils. But no, all these transferences are in her voice. At a young age, as if angels are gift wrapping in her tiny throat, and one of the angels feels claustrophobic. It decides that gold from the wrap is better on the walls of this girl's vocal cord. Thus, she, the girl, becomes an embodiment of a music instrument. Without wind or strum, without lessons, it is off the subject or it is embedded where everything is absolute. High pitch, no. Smooth ascent, yes. 
Catch it like a weightless speaker, the wires connected to ions in a cloud. Too much gray? Bring it down and refocus. Afternoon breeze by the sea. How about the scent of a color? Her youth makes you scratch silver and decide for yourself what aroma is at your fingertips. Her voice would reverberate the color, and all of earth would be atypical until her lips close. I hear color, I see scent, my facial muscles push on my eyes, sight is unneeded, tears do not flood my astounded human ears. Wow, it makes yeah. you want to sing. That's... Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Lovely, uh, lovely sounds in that poem, yeah. especially. Ted, thanks for sharing that. That was Ted Bernal Govera with a Phenom. And that's going to wrap up the uh, show for today. Uh, let's do really quickly the, um, the Saiku. And I wrote a Saiku a while ago. Usually I do it like right before the show <laughs> or like the night before. This one was a little while ago, so I don't even remember what I did. So let's see. This is, uh, I think it was on, I don't remember where I was when I looked at this, but let's, uh, let's see what it is. Need for Speed, How Hummingbirds Switch Mental Gears and Flight. Oh, yeah, that was interesting. So this is this article. Um, they looked at hummingbirds and how their brains work um, to navigate because they move so fast. It's like, you know, how, are they, how do they process all that with these tiny little brains, you know? And so it turns out they have two different, well, let me show you this thing. With you. They have... Um, and this is research from uh, the University of British Columbia. And uh, they have two different sort of like operating programs for guidance, sort of two guidance systems. And one is different for hovering. They, um, they sort of use their environment. They mm -hmm. use their vision. And for uh, moving, they just kind of memorize a path and then follow the path. So they like look where they're going to go and then like do a path okay. that way. And they don't process the stuff as they're flying. And they, to study the effects and, and figure that out, they had this weird box with like, these lines that were moving and making it think it was flying when it wasn't and things Aww. like that. And they were kind of messed with the head of the poor Aww. hummingbird. And uh, so that was the article. And what the heck was the haiku? I don't even know. Let's see. <laughs> um, hummingbirds on autopilot half the day. <laughs> hummingbirds on autopilot half the day. That's right. So there we go. So, yeah, so that's what they said. They said it was like autopilot. Like they're wow. flying, like they're planes on autopilot when they're moving, hmm. and then hovering, they're actually looking around. So, yeah, that's very how they interesting. Do it. Yeah. So, which is, I wonder if they could do another terrible experiment where mm -hmm. they like, you know, they started to fly and then they put like a thing, <laughs> boom, a flower in a their flower way. In their way. Yeah, exactly. so anyway, that was a psych who for this week, <laughs> and that was a show for this week. Thanks everybody for joining us and for being here. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, next week's prompt. I actually know without seeing the slide. Either. Okay, let's... No, I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. no. So what's... We will not even show you. What okay. is the prompt? The prompt is to write a villanelle that has an epigraph. Write a villanelle that yeah. has an epigraph. Yep, yeah. exactly. That's the prompt for next week. Because Tim Siebel's, you know, he loves villanelles. Mm -hmm. And he, if you didn't notice, he has epigraphs in a lot of his poems. Yeah, and I think that's it. a great way to inspire poetry is to pick a kind of quote, maybe... Mm -hmm. And uh, and jump off from there, and and he uses it as a way to pay homage to people mm -hmm. and um, and remember things. I mean, it's really a nice nice yeah. practice he does as part of his yeah. uh, part of his spiritual gesturing. I love too how they you know they came from so many different places. You know, he had the Merwin, the beautiful Merwin quote, and then he had the quote from a stranger. You know, they can come from anywhere and inspire something. And I also had the sense during the episode that it was like it puts you immediately in conversation kind of with what's just happened. Like you're responding to that. And so you're immediately kind of in a conversation. And then everything I thought he was saying about villanelles was also fascinating. Mm -hmm. Made me even happier that that's going to be the prompt. I'm excited to write a villanelle. Yeah, definitely. So Zachary Honeycutt has one up us all. He has. Uh, he definitely <laughs> He's already has. has his villanelle. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, it's kind of like poet respond, but for something, you know, reader here. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's going to be a fun prompt. Write a villanelle with an epigraph. Mm -hmm. And uh, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be uh, Diana Getch. So Diana was the winner of the uh, Rattle Chapel Prize the second year, whichever year that was. Um, her book, um, um, America, America, In America. That was the first. <laughs> her book, In America. It was just a great chat book. Um, she also has a memoir that she's published since then, This Body I Wore. Uh, so really looking forward to Diana. She's a great teacher, too, and just great all-around poet. Uh, that's me, Rattlecast number 229. We'll talk about more recent poems. I think the uh, in America is the 
the most recent book of poems she's published. So she might have new stuff, too. We'll check that out. We'll read some from In America, I'm sure, and we'll talk about This Body I Wore. Uh, that is Rodcast number 229, Monday, January 22nd, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great week, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye.